Thank you, and good evening, everybody. Thank you for your patience today. Um, please remain standing while we go to prayers. As we gather on the eve of Remembrance Day, ever living God, we remember those whom you have gathered from the storms of war into the peace of your presence. May that peace calm our fears, bring justice to all peoples, and establish harmony among the nations. May we exercise that that was won for us with diligence and care, that our endeavours this night serve those we represent, so that all may enjoy the benefits which flow from their sacrifices. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. <coughs> Welcome, members those in the public gallery and those watching on live stream. Before we begin the meeting this evening, I will hand over to Rachel, the Head of Constitutional Services, to go through some housekeeping points. Thank you, Mr Mayor. And through you, in order to conduct this meeting in a safe manner, we ask that all attendees remain seated except for comfort breaks and that social distancing is maintained as much as possible. The Mayor has confirmed that the requirements to stand when speaking have been lifted for this, this meeting. Attendees are asked to wear masks when moving around the building, however masks can be removed when seated. Please ensure that all mobile phones are set to silent, the toilets are located at either side of the engine shed and public toilets are next to the reception area. In the event of an emergency evacuation, the emergency exits are situated at the end of the engine shed. Please ensure that you follow the council staff to evacuate the building. As per normal rules, if you wish to speak, please ensure that you raise your hand and you'll be invited to address the meeting. We are unable to use the voting system, the electronic voting system this evening. Therefore, all votes will be taken by a show of hands unless a recorded vote is requested, which will be taken in the normal way. As per the last meeting, you will have laminated copies of four against and abstain on your table. Four is the green card, against is the red card, and yellow is the abstain, yellow is abstain card. When it comes to vote, please raise the correct coloured document to make it easier for the team. I will take each four against and abstain in turn. There is also a points of order document, also laminated in pink coloured paper on your table. This again is to help the smooth running of the meeting. If you wish to raise a point, please raise the pink document and address the Mayor accordingly. Finally, I would remind members that this meeting is being live streamed, so please make sure that when you speak, you are using your microphone. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Rachel. Agenda item one, apologies for absence. Do we have any? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, we've had apologies from Councillor Elsie and Councillor Fenner. Any other apologies? No, thank you. Item number two, are there any declarations of interest this evening which are not already recorded separately on your individual register of interests? Councillor Sainsbury. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I would like to declare an interest in motion two from Councillor Fox and motion five from Councillor Sanford. As I am employed by one of the MPs as it is proposed to council rights to, I seek advice from the monitoring officer and I can continue to participate and vote as normal. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item three are the minutes of meetings held on 28th of July 2021. I'd like to move approval of the minutes of the special council meeting and the council meeting held on 28th of July 2021. Do I have a seconder? Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I'm delighted to second those for you this evening. Thank you, Leader. Thank you. If there's no objection, I will take that as agreed. Right. Agenda item four. Um, I have one announcement to make. And if you forgive me, I'll... 
turn to my sheet here. I do have one special an announcement to make, details of which are deliberately absent from our papers, but this will become obvious as I continue. The COVID-19 pandemic touched the lives of everyone in the world and has led to significant challenges and personal loss of many. And we extend our condolences to those that have experienced personal tragedies in the past 18 months. It only seems right to recognise those who played a key role in helping set up the Emergency Action Plan to support the residents of Peterborough during this difficult time. These individuals overcame the barriers posed by social distancing, self-isolation and disruption to their own lives to make sure others were able to cope. These awards recognise those who have made a difference by making sure vital services continued. The pressure they must have experienced is far beyond our imagination. And as elected members, we feel they need public recognition. And that recognition is being made tonight in the form of a special commendation award. And its citation reads, you worked in unfamiliar, demanding and success critical roles at the most vulnerable time for our community. Your selflessness and tireless dedication to duty went far beyond anything experienced before. You directly contributed to the vital fabric of our society. Now these leaders will say it was a team effort and I will agree. And I'll leave instructions for each council department to receive a similar message of thanks for display when their offices full reopened. A small gesture perhaps, but entirely heartfelt. It's a pleasure to make this award to the following lead officers to thank them for all they achieved during the most challenging time of their working career. I will now hand over to Rachel to announce the well-deserved recipients. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Could I ask Gillian Beasley, Chief Exec for Peterborough City Council and Cambridgeshire County Council to join the Mayor at the front and collect her certificate and civic gift? Gillian, can you just pop back? We're going to get a photo, sorry. Can you just pop back? Yeah, Ken's coming. He's, he's on his way. Could I now ask Liz Robin, former Director of Public Health for Peterborough City Council, to join the Mayor at the front and collect her certificate and civic gift, please.
Could I now ask Wendy Ogle Wellborn, Executive Director for People and Communities for Peterborough City Council and Cambridgeshire County Council to join the Mayor at the front to collect a certificate and her civic gift? <laughs> Could I now ask Adrian Chapman, Service Director for Communities and Partnerships for Peterborough City Council and Cambridgeshire County Council, to join the Mayor at the front and collect his certificate and his civic gift, please. Could I now ask Jonathan Lewis, Service Director for Education for Peterborough City Council and Cambridgeshire County Council to join the Mayor at the front to collect his certificate and his civic gift, please. And the final one, could I ask the representatives, so Ken and Amanda from Peterborough City Council's communications team to join the Mayor at the front and collect their certificate for the team and their civic gift. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and uh, I hope that was a pleasant surprise for most people. <laughs> and it was good to see Dr. Liz. Uh, agenda item number five. Do you have any announcements, Leader? Yes, I do, Mr. Mayor, if people will indulge me just for a moment. Um, firstly, I'd just like to start off with a, uh, a note of thanks. Um, it won't have escaped people's um, knowledge that this week we, or in the last few days, we've had two reports published, very serious and challenging reports from SIPFA and uh, Delux, as they are now. So I'd like to firstly just give a note of thanks to Julian colleagues, uh, John Fox and colleagues, uh, Nick Sanford and colleagues, and Shaz Nawaz and colleagues, uh, for stepping up and taking part in what is a very serious situation with our budget. So I'd like Council to acknowledge that and recognise that we are all working together uh, to solve a problem. And it's great that we've got everybody back around the table, and I'd just like to uh, say to Council, thank you all very much. 
and we should acknowledge what work is going on. And I extend that same thanks to the people in those wider groups, because I know you all must be aware. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, we often talk about uh, recycling and climate change uh, in the Council. We never get real time to debate and discuss it. Uh, it won't have escaped your notice tomorrow, and w which is why I say this. I, I would like to see as many people here as possible for our recycling workshop tomorrow so that we can move the Council forward uh, in our ambition to at least get back where we were because we've slipped a bit. We will all acknowledge that. Uh, so that is at 6 o'clock tomorrow night here, and there isn't another point in the agenda where I can raise it. So I thought I'd raise it now and just remind everybody to uh, come take part and let's all try and move that forward as well uh, as a group together. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Leader. And uh, I'm just going to sit back to the previous item. And after my presentations, I wondered if group leaders wish to say a word or two. Councillor Noas? Not, not pressing on you, but uh, just to give you the opportunity. Is that in response to the Leader's announcement? or In, re in response to my presentations. Oh, like the recipients. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you for your presentation. And I've seen firsthand the fantastic work that officers have done uh, over the past 18 months. In fact, I've, I've seen the great work that they've been doing since I've been a councillor, but they really have stepped up uh, in the last 18 months. And it's good to see us recognising the work that they've done. Of course, giving somebody an award uh, in the circumstances, I think, doesn't itself justify the effort that they've put in, but it goes some way to demonstrate that we value their input, and I thank you for doing so, Mr. Mayor. Here, here. Councillor uh, Sandford. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to endorse all that's been said. I think I, I remember in back in March 2020 when I had a conversation with Liz, and I suddenly realized that we were that the, the country in Peterborough was in a, a much more serious situation than I don't think anybody had thought and yeah you know, I don't think anybody I think it, it was challenging for us all as individuals but it was particularly challenging for the chief executive and the director of public health who in a period when we necessarily had to suspend some of the democratic structures the the real brunt of the the, the onus of decision making was actually on them, and they, uh, to use the phrase, they stepped up to the plate, and and I think probably you know Peterborough came through it as as well as we could have hoped, and and I think also our thanks need to, I think as already mentioned, need to be extended not just to the people at the top, but all of those officers th um, throughout the organisation who were sometimes you know, not doing their normal jobs. They'd moved into other more c critical functions. We need, we need to thank them. I um, just briefly want to respond to what the leader of the council said. Um, you know, I've made it quite clear that whilst the Liberal Democrat group wants to hold the administration responsible for the way, for, 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 the, for the council getting itself into this situation, we absolutely <laughs> re recognize that we are where we are. And we've said that we will work in a, in a cooperative way to, to try and f find a w w way forward. One of the things I've also said, I said it at the group leaders meeting and I said it at the financial sustainability working group last night, is that these, these are problems that are the problems not just of the cabinet, not just of group leaders, but and, and not even just of the council, it's a problem that the whole of Peterborough has. So, I would, ask, I would actually request that at the earliest possible opportunity there is a meeting of full council where these issues can be talked through. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fox. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd like to say I'd like to congratulate him for going above and beyond the call of duty, but equally I wouldn't have expected anything other than that from each individual person and all their crew. Sometimes we take our officers for granted. We should never, ever do that because they do work hard and they, they worked hard during this pandemic as they always do on other things. But they exceptionally worked hard, putting tireless hours in working for this city and we have to all be grateful to their professionalism and dedication. 
Councillor Howell. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd also like to endorse the comments that have already been made. Um, this pandemic um, feels like it's been here all the time now, doesn't it? It's been such a long time we've been dealing with it. And, of course, it is a public health crisis, but it's very clear it's also a mental health crisis. And during the course of the past couple of years, my role as a councillor has changed. I'm sure that's the same for many people here, because things have changed for our residents, residents who we thought might cope are not coping and have needed um, caring support. And we've been there as councillors for them, but council staff and Gillian and all of her teams have been there for us. So I'd just like to acknowledge that and say thank you so much uh, for keeping us all running. And we still need you. I know you're leaving us, Gillian, but uh, in the, into the future we still need the team very much because this thing is far from over, um, unfortunately, but thank you. And just to um, add to what Councillor Fitzgerald has said, um, we're pleased to be involved. We hope to be listened to. You've got three strong green women here who've got lots to say um, on the subject. So thank you for including us and we'll make our best efforts. We are a small team, but we'll make our best efforts to come along to those meetings that you've invited us to. And we will see you tomorrow night at the recycling workshop. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you. Um, Councillor Fitzgerald, Mr. you're usually top of the list for comments, are you, uh, for the presentations? Uh, in, indeed, uh, we must miss out Councillor Fox as well. Um, uh, the, 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 fact, the fact of the matter is, you know, I, I'm not going to keep everybody. Everybody knows what a great uh, uh, team everybody has been, and that work still continues today. It's not over, um, uh, and, I, and I know that Liz has moved on, and in fact, I know she, what job she's doing now, which is probably just as challenging um, in looking after a mother. So, you know, I wish you well with that. Uh, and all the team that remain here and those that are departing in the future, that contribution, you know, not just through COVID, uh, that has been important, won't be forgotten. And those that remain will continue that good work into the future. So uh, I, would, I would join in commending uh, all of them. Uh, the hardest thing this week has been trying to keep it secret from Gillian. Uh, <laughs> so who knows everything generally? So that's been tough. We've cracked it for once, yeah. <laughs> right, thank you, everybody. I'm moving on to agenda item number six, questions with notice by members of the public. I have number one from John Hopkins. Would you like, Mr Hopkins, would you like to ask a question relating to a tree in Breton? Uh, uh, Mr Mayor, it doesn't appear to be here. Thank you. Um, I shall move on to question two from Richard Olive. Mr Olive, would you like to ask your question relating to water usage? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I'm uh, Richard Olive. I'm a company member of the Peter Environment City Trust. Recently, I've been carrying out a study on behalf of the PECT members regarding sustainable water usage in Peterborough. As many of you will no doubt be fully aware, the future supplies of sustainable waters are predicted to be a serious consequence of climate change. I like to be topical. Uh, Peterborough is officially located in a water-stressed area. I was pleased to find that the Peterborough Local Plan 2016 to 2036 Policy LP32, Water Efficiency Objective, states to minimise impact on the water environment, all new dwellings should achieve the, the optional technical housing standard of 110 litres per day for water efficiency as described by Building Regulations G2. Note that the standard requirement is 125 litres per person per day. Upon making further investigations, both to the PCC's building development and control sections, I was informed that the water minimisation condition has to be applied at the outline planning stage. However, on consulting all planning permissions granted from July 2019 to the present day, I was disappointed to find 
that the condition has only been applied twice. Could the relevant cabinet member please inform me why this policy has not been applied to most of the planning applications over the past two years and given that new houses will have an average lifespan of at least 55 years, how much water will be wasted over the next 55 years due to Peterborough City Council's failure to properly apply its own planning policies? Thank you. Councillor Simons, do you wish to respond? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, thank you for your question, Mr Olive. Um, thank you for raising this issue, which I understand was also raised with officers a few weeks ago. I fully agree that we manage our water supplies is very important. How we manage our water supplies, sorry. Um, the matter you raise were discussed at the cross-party member climate working group on the 19th of October where it was acknowledged that higher water efficiency standard had not been applied as a condition to a large number of planning applications since 2019. The reason being a concern around how the condition would be enforced. However, following further discussions on how to implement and enforce the policy, it was confirmed at the working group meeting that higher water efficiency standard will now be made a condition on the vast majority of residential planning permissions granted by this council. Only exceptional, exceptionally will this not be a case as such where it is technically impossible to achieve the standard. Turning to the second part of the question, relating to the volume of water used, it is not possible to calculate the precise water use usage estimated over the past or coming years, as ultimately the entire, ent entirely dependent on homeowners themselves and the volume of water they choose to use. The only saving grace is most of these properties will obviously be on a water meter, so we hope that people will use the water sensibly. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Olive, do you have a supplementary question? Um, yes, I do. Um, I don't accept the fact that it is difficult to ascertain an average water wastage figure. Since I've submitted this question, I've uh, resorted to looking at the outline planning permissions which have been granted for new houses since July 2019. I won't claim to have actually found every single planning permission, but the ones I have looked at using the, um, the standard rate of uh, um, 125 litres rather than the, the lower one uh, has been 228 houses. Now, you, you can in fact calculate quite easily <laughs> The, the number or the, the quantity of water which has been wasted simply by multiplying the 228 houses by the average occupancy, by the wastage on, on each property, by the number of years. Mr Olive, do you have a question in there? Yes. I, I thought you might need the background to this because you've said you can't calculate the figure. I'm just trying to demonstrate that it is possible to, and the figure is really important, and I'm coming to that, which is 158 million litres of water, as a minimum, will be wasted. It may be more than that. And just to put that into perspective, that's equivalent to 63 Olympic-sized swimming pools. If you would like to have a copy of my calculations, I can pass them over to you. But I think this is scandalous because Peterborough... Mr Olive, I must press you for a question, please. Right. Can you please tell me what the council is going to do to redress this wastage situation? For instance, I wonder whether the council could, in fact, apply the code level 5 for water saving rather than the current one, which is only... Uh, code level two. Right, Mr Olive, I'm sorry, but the Constitution allows one minute for the supplementary question. You've taken two for now. Not well, meaning to be rude, but I must, the I must ask 
Councillor Simons to respond, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, um, Mr. Olive, if you have any um, questions, if you could forward an email to me, I'm quite happy to uh, respond that way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Olive. Please do. I find that answer very unacceptable. I'm sorry. Cop out. Thank you, Mr. Olive. Um, question number three from Colin Hammond. Mr. Hammond, would you like to ask your question related to speed calming measures? Yes, please. Go ahead, please. Thank you. First of all, thank you for affording me the opportunity and time to ask my question. Um, as you know, my name is Colin Hammond, and together with my wife and two daughters, we reside at 91 Atherston Avenue. Our house has had a car driven into it twice in the last three years. I am sure you would have seen extensive coverage of the incident in the national news websites, local press, and ITV Anglia News. This is the result of excessive speeding on Atherston Avenue and Buckland Close. Thankfully, no one is injured in these crashes, but who is to say we will be lucky if it happens again? There are three schools in the local vicinity. Incidentally, I'm involved in all these schools in the local vicinity. I'm a trustee at the local academy trust and chair of governors at Thorpe Primary. Buckland Close is used as a thoroughfare by lots of people working and attending the hospital. There are quite a number of children and adults walking on, the road, on these roads during the day. We need, as a matter of urgency, some speed calming measures in place. Neighboring properties have had damage to their walls and cars and light posts being knocked down by speeding vehicles. Ideally, speed bumps would be the preferred choice. And to be more selfish, crash barriers or bollards down, at, uh, down Buckland Close to protect my property as well as keeping my family safe. The emotional stress, inconvenience and financial loss is no fault of our own. As you may have read in the local papers, there have been incidents in the last few weeks where a car drove into the wall of another property in Atherston Avenue. And also the post box was demolished at the Audley Gate Thorpe Park, sorry, Audley Gate Thorpe Park Road Junction. I'm looking for help from the council in giving permission for speed calming measures to be put in place on these roads. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. And Councillor Heller, can you respond? Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, hello, Mr. Hammond. And thanks for your question. In, in answer to uh, your first question about speed calming measures, I can tell you the council officers are working with the police to evaluate what measures might be appropriate for the area, including infrastructure. Um, I will ask, most certainly I will ask, that you're included within that dialogue, Mr Hammond. Um, in answer to your second question uh, regarding a fence move, um, I'll ask one of our planning team to contact you directly to discuss this proposal and to understand what it is exactly that you wish to achieve um, in doing this. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. And Mr. Hammond, do you have a supplementary question? Uh, yes, I do. Um, do we have any timescales? I know you said you're speaking to the police and, and whatever. Do we have any timescales? Because, as you know, twice in three years is not a long time. That's quite quick in terms of accidents. So what are the timescales for speaking to the police and getting any idea of what their recommendations are? Councillor Hiller. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you again, Mr. Hammond. Um, with regard to timescales for the dialogue between our officers and the police, I'm not privy to that, I'm afraid, but I can certainly find that out for you. Um, but I think you've cited very eloquently um, the current situation with your property and outside your property and the latest uh, episode, a uh, very unfortunate episode. So I would hope that um, the timescale is going to be very short and you will be included within that dialogue um, in the very near future. Um, certainly, Mr. Hammond, I'd, like most, I'm sure, I would be very alarmed if, if vehicles regularly crashed into a property that I lived in. As and I stated, um, the officers are taking this very, very seriously indeed. Thank you, Mr. May. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Mr. Hammond. Agenda item number seven, petitions. Those presenting petitions this evening will have one minute to outline their petition request. Are there any petitions from the public? I think. 
Is uh, Mr. Simon Cale here? Uh, Mr. Cale doesn't appear to be here, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Do we have his petition? No, thank you. Okay. Are there any petitions from members? That's a no, thank you. Agenda item number eight. Questions on notice. There have been 21 questions submitted by members this evening. Uh, we'll start with number one from Councillor Kayum. Councillor Steve Allen, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Kayum in relation to the housing revenue account? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I am delighted to respond to the question from Councillor Kayum. Um, I can confirm a lot of work has been done to establish an outline business case for the development of a housing revenue account, HRA. Since an HRA will require the Council to borrow to invest in new housing, a decision has been taken to halt further work until the Council's future financial position is better understood and agreed. Part of this process is the delivery of a renewed overall housing strategy for the Council, of which the HRA will be an integral part. Subject to satisfactory outcome, following the forensic review of housing being undertaken by SIPFA and discussions with DLUC, Department of Leveling, Leveling Up Housing and Communities, work may be able to commence on the development of an HRA sometime in 2022-2023. Thank you. Councillor Cayham, do you have a supplementary? Doesn't appear not. Thank you, Mr. May. Indeed, I do. Um, Councillor Allen, I do thank you for your response, but you've stood up several times in this chamber and repeated your mantra that a HRA is going to happen. So would you like to state publicly on record, is that now not the case? And regarding speaking about needing a better understanding of the council's financial position, surely this is well known, isn't it? It certainly should be by a deputy leader of the council. I'm aware the council has had a comprehensive housing strategy for a number of years. Um, so if I hadn't asked this question this evening, when were you going to let us know your much heralded HRA has in fact been shelved? Thank you. Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and indeed thank you for the supplementary, Councillor Quayam. Um, I will put it on record that I'm very supportive of an HRA for this, this council, for this city. Uh, and indeed, it is a mechanism to deal with the housing crisis that we do have. However, as you well know from your party being involved in the, in the uh, conversations about the financial status of the council, we have to park things until the outcome of uh, the uh, SIPFA and DLUC um, conversation is better known to us. Um, it's okay shaking your head. The fact is, I'm a protagonist of this mechanism, and the leader is very supportive. Indeed, we have made an arrangement to go and speak to another nearby council to look at their mechanisms for providing this kind of housing. So don't shake your head. Just be on side and support us in making this happen. Thank you. Indeed, we very much are, but the question was very relevant. So thank, the shaking thank, of thank the you. head was very significant. Councillor Kayam. Uh, question two. Councillor Simons, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Iqbal in relation to the Piri project? Yeah, I would, thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Iqbal, for your question. I note, I note that you've indicated that you're a shadow cabinet member for waste, street scene and the environment. I do feel slightly disappointed, Mr Councillor Iqbal. We have had some real issues with regard to this portfolio. Not once have you contacted me or my senior officers with regard to any issues. I also asked all members to attend health and, safety, health and safety training to be in a petition to help if required. You did not apply. You did not attend um, the carbon literacy training. We have a recycling workshop tomorrow evening. I hope you will be attending. Forgive me. Okay, I will move on to the question in hand. Piri, Peterborough Integrated Renewable Infrastructure. The project aims to deliver a smart local energy network which integrates the next generation heat network, electricity through private wires and mobility through electric vehicle infrastructure. 
The project was launched in April 2020. We are currently halfway through. We have engaged with circa 120 businesses, which you can appreciate has been challenging within the pandemic. We now have in place the techno-economic reports. The next step is to do a scheme outline and development a detailed design. The final output expected in 2023 will be investment grade, a green book, compliant business case, bringing together all the findings and detailing the opportunity available for Piri. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I yes. do have a supplementary question. Councillor Iqbal, do you have a supplementary? Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> I thank Councillor Simons for his detailed response to my question. There's a large amount of jargon in there and words like intelligent digital platform, modelling and option appraisal, techno-economic reports, and non-heat transport, and I think you said an investment grade Green Book compliant business case. All this means little to the taxpayer in the street, I'm afraid, Mr. Mayor. I have to say, I was somewhat surprised to read on the council's website that Councillor Seresti was an environment cabinet member at that time this lengthy program uh, was announced. He is quoted as then saying, this will produce heat to benefit Peterborough residents you need to and ask will be ask a I'm coming to that, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, the most exciting and innovating clean green energy project the city and indeed the country has ever seen. Those of us who what have been in your question, chamber, Councillor Iqbal, please. The question, I'll come to the question. Uh, no, I can I have your uh, question immediately, background. please? Uh, okay, in that case, Mr. Mayor, I'll come to the question. Um, from what you said, Councillor Simons, um, after three long years of effort and expense, we just get a business case, nothing physical, nothing remotely benefiting Peterborough residents. What happens to this promise, most exciting green energy project the country has ever seen after that time? When will anything be delivered? Thank, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Simons. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bell, for your question. Yeah, you, you must appreciate this is obviously a complex situation. It's not as though we're starting from scratch. We've got to introduce this within, the, obviously, the infrastructure that's already, already there. So it's a very complex situation, and it, we're gonna, it's going to require outside funding to deliver this. Um, so hopefully by 2023, as I had said earlier, we should be in a position that we can put it out to tender and then hopefully move on from there. But obviously, it's a very complex situation. Yeah, thank you. Apologies for trying to hurry things along, but we have 21 questions to get in 13 minutes. And I will add for people who are asking that uh, the questions aren't, the initial questions aren't being read out because they've been published and this is the way we do things now. Um, I'm going to move to Councillor. No was now. Question three. Councillor Steve Allen, would you like to respond to the question of Councillor Shaz Nawaz in relation to rough sleeping? Thank you, Mr Mayor, and I'm conscious of the need to hurry on. I'm afraid it's a fairly lengthy response, so I'll uh, get through it best I can. Uh, the Council's Rough Sleeper Outreach Team have a current cohort of 26 individuals who are still sleep sleeping out. And I forgot to say this is uh, in response to uh, Councillor Shaz Nawaz's question, so... Excuse me, I was not being rude. Uh, this number has increased over recent months following the country's withdrawal from the EU and uh, us not legally being able to provide accommodation and services for those who aren't eligible for assistance. The housing needs team continues to work tirelessly to ensure that all eligible rough sleepers have an offer to come into accommodation uh, and will be supported to address their health and welfare needs as well as finding suitable accommodation provision. At the height of the pandemic, we were accommodating 128 households who we would not normally have the duty to, over 100 folk in B&B &B at that stage. Uh, we continue to have an offer to all eligible rough sleepers, and the team have successfully housed a large number of former rough sleepers into suitable accommodation, such as uh, the location at Lincoln House that was commissioned earlier this year. 
We have now brought the number of rough sleeper households down to 44, and currently only 11 have ha um, households in B and B. Um, the main stumbling block currently is that many of our rough sleeper cohort, as I ha highlighted previously, are not eligible for homelessness assistance, and we are not permitted to provide accommodation to them. Um, we are still engaging with the, these individuals and are able to offer reconnection to their home countries. Unfortunately, however, many have nothing to go back to. Other issues such as drug and alcohol misuse are still very prevalent, but support services for these issues are strong and available. Thank you, Councillor Nawaz. Thank you. Councillor Shaznawaz, do you have a supplementary? I do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Allen, for your response. That, as you'll appreciate, the winter months are going to be extremely difficult uh, for those who sleep rough, uh, and I'd like to know what significant efforts you intend to make to reach out to those people to offer them additional support, especially those who qualify for uh, assistance. Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Councillor Nawaz, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the fact is the team work tirelessly to uh, connect with the rough sleepers, and we are very much reliant on some of the outside help we receive from organisations such as the Light Project. So the council are cognizant of the problem. The team are out there engaging where they can, and we are using outside assistance uh, available to us. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, question four, Councillor Simons, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Haynes in relation to COP26 and net zero? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Haynes, for the question. Um, Peterborough City Council is committed to being, com becoming net zero by carbon by 2030. Also assist Peterborough to become a net zero city by the same date. We have a history of having ambitious environmental targets. We lead in a number of solar panels and electric vehicles. We have recently been selected by government as a pilot area to develop a local area plan. We are working with stakeholders across the city to create a pipeline of projects that will enable us to meet our decarbonisation ambitions. I believe our cross-party environment working group is proving a very valuable asset. Let's not be under any illusions. These are bold targets and they're going to require cross-party engagement. I would encourage all those members who have not attended carbon literacy training to please attend. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Haynes, do you have a supplementary? I do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you uh, for the answer. I was just wondering exactly what are we going to do that is going to that is going above and beyond what the government would be recommending um, if their target is 2050 and ours is 2030. What is it that we have planned that makes us believe that we can reach that target? Um, and I was wondering if you can assure me: is it that we are focusing on reducing our carbon emissions, or are we looking at offsetting a certain amount of our emissions to achieve that target? Thank you. Councillor Simons. Yeah, thank, thank you, Councillor Haynes. I think, to be honest, we, we are looking at our, every single aspect. I mean, there's su it's such a, a wide area that um, you can't sort of pinpoint it. And I think, as I say, the, the cross-party working group is invaluable as far as I'm concerned because we're just coming up with ideas all the time and looking at every single angle, if I'm honest. Thank you. Thank you. Question five. Councillor Bisbee, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Warren? in relation to the Ofsted focused visit. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Councillor Warren, for your question. Uh, yes, Ofsted did indeed in undertake a focused visit to Peterborough, and that was in June of this year. During this visit, they concentrated on how well we support our children and young people in care. As corporate parents, I am sure that all members will be pleased to hear that the report following the visit was very positive. Ofsted said that Peterborough was a conscientious corporate parent and praised us for the very good placement stability of our children in care. <coughs> Inspectors said that our social workers knew the children and young people well and there was a clear commitment to ensure children in care achieve good outcomes across the service and within partner agencies, including, for example, our virtual school as well as the schools that our children attend. In any inspection, there will be things identified where we can improve. 
Ofsted noted that a relatively large proportion of children in care are placed at distance from Peterborough, while also acknowledging that, their most, that most were placed in settled and well-matched foster or extended family homes. They also thought that some of our written rec recording could be improved. But they also said that the quality of our assessments and planning for our children in care was good, that our staff felt well supported, included through the COVID pandemic, and that they had manageable caseloads. Importantly, they said that senior leaders have a clear understanding of the issues for children and young people in care, and that children in care told inspectors that they are confident that senior managers listen to their views and take action in response. Focus visits do not result in graded outcomes. Ofsted published a short letter about their findings and any areas for improvement. This is available on their link that can be passed around to everybody or you can go online and search for Peterborough Ofsted reports. I do think it's a good idea for all members, as we are all corporate parents, to take the time to read the letter in full, since it really does show just how well our staff, foster carers, partner agencies and members through the Corporate Parenting Committee have worked together to deliver what continues to be a very good service for our children and young people in care. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Warren, do you have a supplementary question? I do not have a supplementary question, but I'd just like to thank uh, Councillor Bisbee for that comprehensive answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor, uh, question six. Councillor Simons, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Imtiaz Ali in relation to reducing carbon emissions? Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. Busy night. Um, Councillor, thank you for your question, Councillor Ali. Peterborough City Council is committed to be carbon neutral by 2030, as already mentioned this evening. The combined authority is developing an alternative fuel strategy for the area, which includes electric charging. PCC allocates 150k per year for electric charging points. In residential areas, you are able to receive 75% funding from government, with often companies providing the other 25%. Along with my fellow cabinet member, uh, Councillor Peter Hill, we are committed to improving the amount of charging points. I know some members would believe we need to be committed, but that's another argument. Uh, charging points have been discussed at the cross-party working group. We feel these need to be cost-neutral, so we believe a small cost should be levied to achieve this, including taxes. A grant is available for off-street parking charging points for those areas without off-street parking. Again, the cross-party working group are discussing these issues. We feel this requires careful consideration due to the health and safety issues when uh, obviously charging points outside, you know, say, terraced houses. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Mtiaz Ali, do you have a supplementary? Uh, yes, Mr Mayor, I do. Um, thank you for the answer. I think um, there was five parts to the question, so I appreciate it was a long question and some of the points were missed. Um, but just thinking outside the box, is it something that you're considering in terms of uh, putting in uh, some kind of uh, requirement for new planning developments to have um, electric vehicle charging points? Councillor Simons. Yeah, thank, thank you, Councillor. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we, we look at all alternatives. Um, it's not something that I'm aware of at the moment, but obviously it's something we would definitely consider. Thank you. Mr Mayor, I'm, I'm sorry to go out of protocol, but could I just supplement, answer or add to that supplementary answer in that the Northminster development, um, we are creating parking spaces in Northminster regeneration with um, EV connectivities, if, if that helps. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hiller. Um, question seven, back to you, Councillor Hiller. Can you respond to the question from Councillor Sanford in relation to... Bus, service. Bus services. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, was that me? Yes, Councillor Hiller. A question from Councillor Sanford. Yes. 
Um, no, yes, of course. I'm sorry. I was slightly out of kilter then. Um, it's still excited about Northminster. I do apologize. Another no, feeling. Um, and ordering my electric car. Um, thank you for the question, uh, Councillor Sanford. The, the combined authority is aware of the recent cuts to services by Stagecoach due to the ongoing driver shortage and the high rate of COVID infections. Um, it, it's causing a need for drivers and other staff to self-isolate, I'm afraid. Um, we have assurances from Stagecoach that those reductions are indeed temporary, um, but I might also add that other bus operators have reported similar problems to us. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Sanford. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I'm grateful for that response, but I do think it was a little bit complacent on the second part of the question, which is the potential serious hazard to public health if at peak hours bus services are only running at half of the previous frequency, these bus services could become overcrowded. So could I ask what representations he's made and what discussions he's had with the Director of um, Public Health about the potential serious health hazard from, um, from, from, from this situation? And will he also re recognize that before we had Brexit, we didn't have food shortages, we didn't have shortage of heavy goods vehicles drivers, we didn't have shortage of bus um, drivers. And so does he regret his party's policy of um, Brexit? Can you... Uh, I think that's a rising no. I think the first part of your question could be answered. So I'll ask Councillor uh, Hiller to do so. Yes, of course, Mr. Mayor, and I thank Councillor Sanford indeed for both elements of his question. Um, both these circumstances, COVID and the driver shortages, are, are events that need to be managed locally. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I personally have had um, no dialogue with our um, health folk, but I'm sure our transport officers have, and I'd be more than happy to relate that dialogue um, to Councillor Sanford. Um, Thank you, can, then. Can I just um, say, Mr Mayor, sorry can, can to, to cut across no, you, but it may, it may very well be, Mr Mayor, that, that Councillor Sanford has regular experience of, of Waitrose and perhaps some more upmarket retailers. Um, I shop at Lidl. I, I struggle to afford Waitrose, I'm afraid. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Right, question eight. <laughs> Councillor Simons, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Sandra Bond in relation to the brown bin waste? Yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you for your question, Councillor Bond. You will be aware that it was an operational decision to suspend the brown bin collection. We are still four crews down, plus we require an extra two crews with the expansion of the city. We also have four drivers due to retire next year. As the service has been su suspended, Aragon will not receive payment for the service. There will be a small cost to reimburse residents. With regard to the extra waste going through the ERF facility, it costs us around £100 per tonne to tip, uh, but we do re receive a feed-in tariff of around 240k uh, per month. I would urge residents to use our very good HRC, if possible, to dispose of their garden waste. We also offer a discounted home composters. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Sandra Bond, do you have a supplementary? Um, yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you, Councillor Simon, for your reply to my original question. Um, if residents get into the habit of putting garden waste into their black bin, is there not a danger that this habit will continue when brown bins collection are resumed, given that they might prefer to, waste collect, um, might prefer to have waste collected free of charge in the black bin rather than having to pay for it? So what is the likely ongoing damage to council finances of this happening? Thank you. Councillor Simons. Yeah, th thanks, Councillor Bond. Um, obviously, probably there's a waste, waste strategy going through the government at the moment. As previously mentioned, it's very likely that uh, garden waste will become um, compulsory collection. So I don't think there's any um, danger of that. I think as soon as we can reintroduce the brown bins, I'm sure residents will quite happily put their uh, garden waste back into that, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question nine. Now, as written here, I've got uh, a question from Councillor John Fox in relation to the maintenance of borders. You left the Navy some time ago. You're not patrolling borders now. Um, Councillor Simons, can you respond to the original question from Councillor Fox? 
Yeah, thank, thank you, Councillor Fox, for your question. I agree. In some areas, the grass appears to be creeping across the paths. Unfortunately, there is no provision in the Aragon contract to edge the paths. I believe this is an issue we need to address going forward. I will discuss this with the appropriate team. If you are aware of any areas of concern, please do contact me. Thank you. Councillor John Fox, do you have a supplementary? I do indeed, Mr Mayor. I'm sure you'll say yes to this. I hope you will anyway. Would you be prepared to walk, uh, take a walk around our area to see the uh, prestigious area I'm on about and see how far it's getting into a mess? And uh, if we can work out some way of remedying that, I'd be over the moon, and so would my residents. Councillor Simons. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Fox. Happy to meet any uh, councillor in any areas uh, regard my portfolio any time. Thank you. Question 10. Councillor Steve Allen, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Murphy in relation to temporary accommodation? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Councillor Murphy, for your question. Happy to respond. Um, the Council are currently accommodating 319 households in temporary accommodation. This is compared to 393 households at the same time last year and 413 the year previously. The longest current household, ha longest current household has been in... Oh, that doesn't read well. I should have checked it, shouldn't I? The longest a current household has been in temporary accommodation for three year, is for three years and one month. This accommodation is for a self-contained house which is of the right size and suitability for their household. All households provided with temporary accommodation are awaiting a permanent solution. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Murphy, do you have a supplementary? No, I do not. Thank you. Councillor 11. Uh, sorry, question 11. Councillor Steve Allen, would you like to respond to the question for Councillor Wigan in relation to HMO regulation? Thank you, Mr Mayor, and uh, thank you, Councillor Wigan. Um, officers have produced a timetable that would see an Article 4 direction introduced towards the end of 2022 or early 2023, subject to the evidence and approval. We are still in the evidence gathering stage and will shortly commence citywide consultation to gather further evidence. We are running about six weeks behind schedule at present. However, we have built in a potential for slippage into the programme and this should not affect the overall timetable. Thank you. Councillor Wigan, do you have a supplementary? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to thank uh, Councillor Allen for his uh, update. Um, I'm sure the residents of Hampton and other areas who are keen to see this introduced will be pleased to hear that. Thank you. Councillor Simons, would you like to respond to question 12 from Councillor Hogg in relation to food waste bins? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm sure members are trying to wear me out this evening. Uh, the food waste has been a great success, with 743 tonnes of waste collected April to October, an impressive 31% increase. Unfortunately, we do not have the data to how many households are using the service. As you may have seen, loaders empty the food into a small wheelie bin and then put it into the vehicle separate pod. The approximate cost was £73,000. Most of the funding was provided by RAP, Waste and Resources Action Plan. Cost savings to date is approximately 65 k to date. Thank you. Councillor Hogg, do you have a supplementary? I do. Um, and thank you very much for your uh, response, Councillor Simons. Um, <clears throat> the issue of um, food, food waste bin collection um, is one that is particularly apparent in, in terms of um, flats, um, because the vast majority of them do, ha do not have the provision for residents to be able to, um, to separate their, their food waste. Um, so uh, on one hand, um, I want to know what, what is going to be done about new, we seem to have a, a plethora of new flats going up, in fact not far from where we, we sit now today, um, uh, and across the city. Um, what is being done to, to put into the planning process um, the ability for residents to be able to separate their, their food waste? And then secondly, what is being done with existing flats to kind of retrofit some sort of solution so that they can also 
um, separate their food waste so that it can be, um, you know, they can have the same service that, that other citizens uh, have got you. across the city. Councillor okay. Simons. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Hogg. Yeah, that's a very good point, and um, I'll take that away and seriously look at that. Thank you. Question 13. Councillor Steve Allen, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Howell in relation to the Speedway team? Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Howell. I'm so pleased we did get to this question, and I would certainly like to congratulate the Panthers on a stunning success. To go from finishing bottom in the last Premiership season to topping the league and winning the playoffs is a superb achievement, and Rob Lyon, staff and riders deserve huge credit. It's been a great year on the sporting front, following on from Peterborough United's promotion, and hopefully there is much more for us to cheer over the coming months. So I'd say go Panthers, up the posh, and not forgetting the Phantoms and all of our great sporting teams that bring pleasure to so many. Councillor Howell, do you have a supplementary? No supplementary question, Mr Mayor, but I do thank Councillor Allen for his enthusiasm, which um, I share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've done the 30 minutes, a lot of time for this, the questions. All remaining questions, we will receive a written answer in due course. Uh, agenda item 8D, uh, questions on notice. Uh, submitted by members to combined authority representatives this evening. Question one from Councillor Murphy and Councillor Fitzgerald. Can you respond to the question from Councillor Murphy in relation to the combined authority vision for transport? Yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. I, um, I'm happy to respond to Councillor Murphy. I think I might have to circulate uh, a, a written version of this because it does contain a, a, a table, Councillor Murphy, which... Uh, I don't expect you to write them all down, but the current programme for the development of the LTCP is set out in the table below. And of course, I realised you may not have the table below, uh, but I'll read it out nonetheless. So the 27th of October, uh, there is a CA board meeting. The 1st until the 28th of November, there is a soft launch engagement. Until the 17th of December, there is drafting of the LTCP. From the 6th to the 17th of December, there is a soft launch review. From the 17th of January to the 25th of February, there's a consultation period number two. From the 21st of February to the 4th of March, there's a cons consultation number two review period. From the 21st of February to the 4th of March, LTCPs following consultation number two. And then 28th of February, 31st of March, there is prep for the SEA, CIA and HIA. I realise, of course, you may not have got all those down, so I'll, I'll have one of the teams circulate that schedule to you for the uh, preparation of that development. As part of the current engagement process following on from that, which commenced on Monday the 1st of November, uh, there is a specific question related to the revised vision for transport in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. The draft vision, as it stands, states... A transport network which secures a future in which the region and its people can thrive. It must put improved public health at its core. It must help create a, fair, a fairer society. It must respond to climate change targets. It must protect our environment and clean up our air. And it must be the backbone of sustainable economic growth in which everyone can prosper. And it must bring a region of cities, market towns and very rural areas closer together. It will be achieved by investing in a properly joined up net zero carbon transport system, which is highly reliable, high quality, convenient, affordable and accessible to everyone. Better, cleaner public transport will reduce private car use and more cycling and walking will support both healthier lives and a greener region. Comprehensive connectivity, including digital improvements, will support a sustainable future for our region's nationally important and innovative economy. Please note that the consultation following this initial engagement will commence in January 2022. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Do you have a supplementary question? Uh, yes, I do, Mr Mayor. Thank you very much um, for addressing 
the LTCP and outlining the dates and plans for that. The reason for my question was I watched the last board meeting and a couple of members, and particularly a Conservative member, asked what was the transport vision and put a marker down that maybe the authority will not continue to be funded because it doesn't actually have a purpose and know what it's doing. Um, you did talk about some of the words going out for consultation, and they're, they're good words about public health, um, and about better and cleaner, and about the future, but currently there is no agreed vision from the combined authority. When will we have that vision? Councillor Fitzgerald. I think there was a vision for uh, an innovative transport system, but the new Labour Mayor cancelled it. So I suggest you might want to ask the new Labour Mayor for Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, as members of the Combined Authority did, what his lead on a transport vision for Cambridgeshire is. Because I certainly think, as I pointed out at that meeting, that the past mayor did have a vision, now, which was democratically voted through. That has since been overturned again democratically. And that's the way it goes. So I think if I was being honest about the current mayor, and I've told him, I've challenged him on his vision about he, how he might set the agenda and lead a vision for Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. That, so far, to my satisfaction, has not been forthcoming, and to a number of others on the combined authority. However, all I can hope is that it is a work in progress, and I, as representing Peterborough, will play my part in shaping that vision for the future. Thank you. Um, question two, and Councillor Fitzgerald again. Would you like to respond to the question for Councillor Wigan in relation to bus franchising? I will, Mr. Mayor. Just give me a second to find my... Um, <laughs> uh, the combined authority uh, is aware of recent cuts to services by Stagecoach Council Wigan due to the ongoing driver shortage um, and the high rate of COVID infections, causing a need for drivers and other staff to self-isolate. We have assurances from Stagecoach that these reductions are temporary. Other bus operators have also reported similar problems to us. I think a colleague alluded to that earlier tonight, and we're all aware of similar issues uh, across the country. I wouldn't accept earlier statements about there being no driver shortages before Brexit either. It's been a well-known fact that people in certain industries, particularly HGV, that has been an ongoing issue uh, for, for a long time. Both these circumstances, COVID and the driver shortage, are events that need to be managed locally regardless of the ownership structure of the buses. Separately, the mayoral elections earlier this year, all three candidates stood on a platform of seeking to alter the way bus services in the combined authority area are run. And work on this topic of bus reform is being progressed despite the difficulties caused by the pandemic. Earlier this year, the Department for Transport, DFT, published a national bus strategy. And as part of this, we've confirmed to the DFT that we sought authority to consider franchising in May 2019 which I can uh, uh, say is true. The DFT guidance is that they should expect mayoral authorities, which have started to investigate franchising, could, should continue to do so. I would also add at this point um, that we are looking also with our transport team about how buses work, both in Peterborough and in a wider context across the county. Mm -hmm. A Treasury Green Book business case is being independently audited at present, looking at the options open, the costs and risks. The Combined Authority is currently developing a public engagement round to explain to the public the options of A, an enhanced partnership with bu bus operators, or B, a franchising solution. This engagement work will explain the two approaches and ask the electorate for their views. Once the engagement process and the audit are complete, the results of both will then be used to take a financial, de a, a, a final decision. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Wigan, do you have a supplementary question? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to thank uh, the leader for his comprehensive answer there and also um, for Councillor Hiller's answer before giving reassurance on um, the resumption of uh, services from Stagecoach when uh, they are able to do so. 
Um, I look forward to hearing further from uh, the leader and others as this progresses through its uh, many stages by the sound of it. Um, do we in this council have a champion for bus and public transport users? If not, is that something we could consider? Thank you. I couldn't specifically say there is somebody with that title, um, but I know a lot of people certainly on, on this side um, in terms of their interest whether for, for climate change and I myself have been championing recently, you will have seen me in the combined authority meetings and elsewhere, uh, talking about how quickly can we get electric buses into the city uh, and I'm very keen to do that but it is complex in the sense that I, I've talked about you know, the conversations I'm having with Charlotte Palmer and the climate change team and indeed our transport team about how we can improve not only bus services per se but um, the electrification of the bus network uh, because it's gone into Cambridge uh, and there's been new funding just recently been announced for that so I'm very keen to pursue that uh, challenge so I suppose the answer to your question is me uh, primarily uh, that has been trying to move this forward and it was only this week and I've tasked officers already to find out how we can unlock what is a, 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 a problem with setting the agenda for putting the infrastructure in uh, to electrify bus, buses and working with Stagecoach and or indeed other franchisees. So let's not just think it's all about that. So there is work going on, there is pressure going on from me at all levels and officers because they know I'm keen to try to develop it. Right. <coughs> Thank you. We shall now move on to agenda item 9A. Cabinet recommendation, um, university funding and finance interim update. This is in relation to the reallocation of the capital programme budget to deliver a car park for the university project. Information on this can be found in the agenda pack. Councillor Hiller, would you therefore like to move the recommendation? Um, yes, Mr. Mayor, I would, and I thank you for the opportunity. Um, members, I hope, will have read the report setting out a number of uh, recommendations that I presented to Cabinet for approval last month for us to consider this evening. Um, the report falls within the university responsibilities of Councillor Ayres and the somewhat less exciting car park provision within my own portfolio. Um, Ms. Mayor, I don't propose to spend a great deal of time introducing the report to members tonight because it's all here in front of you. Uh, save to remind you that the recommendation is that Council authorise the reallocation of the capital programme budget for the university access and slip roads to deliver the car park by 2022, utilising getting building funding grant and Council £500,000 match funding. I imagine Councillor Ayres may well have something to say on the report and our colleague Councillor Coles might have further information and explanation on the environment process and the numbers. Thank you Mr Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Ayres, will you second the recommendations? Neither speak now or reserve your right to speak later in the debate. I will certainly second. Thank you Mr Mayor for requesting me to do so and I will reserve my right to speak. Thank you. Can I call upon any other speakers? Councillor Hogg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so um, I, I'm not not against um, the funding of, of the university, but we've we've all been told that we need to put on hold um, our plans um, pending review. Um, we've we've been in numerous. Meetings that uh, we've talked about how the um, that the housing fund uh, needs to be uh, shelved until such time as the the review is done, um, and I think um, it is certainly the view of our our, our group that um, th this should be included in that that it, it should be shelved until such time as we have had a chance to look at our finances um, across the board uh, to see if this this expenditure is in fact still needed um, you know we, we we've said quite clearly um, across all of these meetings that there are going to be some very um, strong decisions to be made um, unpalatable decisions 
in terms of cutting back on our, uh, our finances, specifically the capital programme. Um, and I think it would be right and proper for us to send the message back to government that we are uh, taking this responsibility on board and that we are um, taking it very seriously and expenditures such as this should be shelved until such time as we have done a proper uh, review as we have been not just requested but basically told we have to do. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Day. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my question is, is sort of echoes what Councillor Hoggers said. Um, I sort of read through the report and given our financial position and the reports that SIPFRA and the government reviews that have been, um, that have been published last week have said that we need to halt any non-statutory services from our capital uh, but from our capital budget, is this match funding still able to proceed? That was my sort of question, really. Or is it? Or are we ring fencing it? What, what are we actually doing um, uh, in this instance? Thank you, Councillor Coles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to respond to the questions from Councillor Hogg and Councillor Day, if I may. Um, just to clarify this sum, the original sum of two million pounds was set aside, and that was to deliver access as well as a car park and we've now reduced that borrowing by one and a half million pounds just retaining one quarter of the sum so we have actually already made a saving in this process better than that we can also regard it as an investor save program because once the car park is built we then lease that to the university and we then receive rental from that which will in fact pay the entire sum so we are very content that this is an entirely appropriate use of the budget we have saved one and a half million and we're going to get the money back so that is um, an entirely appropriate use of what was already agreed bear in mind we're also saving on, on one and a half million pounds of borrowing um, so that's an, an additional saving to the, to the council's budget thank you mr mayor thank you councillor Stanford. yes thank you mr mayor um i i reiter reiterate the points that my colleague councillor hogg made that you know we've been given two instructions amongst a number of other instructions by central government one is to cease anything but the most absolutely legally required essential capital spending i think you know this there might be arguments for this but i don't think it's it's a legal requirement that we have to that we have to do it we've also been told that we're supposed to um more more closely align our budgets to the corporate priorities of the council now I thought one of the corporate priorities of the it, it's very unclear if you look on the council website what the co corporate priorities of, of the council are and, and I would ask you to go and look at it if you if you haven't it's, it's very confusing but I thought one of our priorities was to get the Peterborough to net zero carbon by 20, 2030 so I think the question is how are we going to achieve that if we just carry on building car parks? Now, the, I appreciate that the um, university may require a car park of some size, but I'm not clear from the report how large this car park is. And in fact, I'm not clear from the report whether it's a car park for the university or a car park for the regional pool. What I have seen in, in various... Um, meeting routes that I've seen that the cabinet wants to close the regional pool in its current location and relocate it to an alternative location so but it does clearly say in the report that 128 of these unknown number of car parking spaces are for the regional pool so when you've closed the regional pool you're just going to be handing over a further 128 car parking spaces to the university so I do think you know full council is being asked to, to approve this I'm not convinced this is in line with our corporate priorities I'm not sure it's essential expenditure so I think that we should ask the cabinet to take this back and come forward with a more convincing explanation as to, to why this expenditure is, re is re required. All right, uh, Councillor Shaznawas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's no secret that the Labour group is extremely supportive of the university, but as has been said by my colleagues, Christian, Nicola, uh, and Nick, we were in a meeting last night 
uh, where the leader made it very clear that uh, all capital spending was on hold uh, and although we support this particular recommendation, perhaps Councillor Coles or Councillor Hiller could explain that we're under the microscope of MHCLG uh, and if they challenge us and question us on why we went ahead with this particular priority uh, rather than setting aside possibly setting aside other priorities or possibly compromising or jeopardising other priorities, uh, what answer we would have ready for them uh, which would demonstrate that we've done our homework and then we're on top of our game. Councillor Ed Murphy. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, yes, I'd like this one to be reconsidered, actually. Uh, we're told to expect a big meeting in the next few weeks about budgets. As we've heard from other councillors tonight, we were told, and um, leaders of groups have had meetings, that all capital spending is on hold. Apparently that's been said. Well, this demonstrates it isn't. And this isn't current capital spending. This is additional new capital spending. So wait a few weeks. Um, one of the members of the administration said, oh, but we've already made savings. No, you've decreased the amount of extra capital you were going to spend. That's not a saving. Money hasn't come into the council. It's just going to cost you less. And the university, really, you know, we've got city centre empty spaces where the Queensgate cinema is being built. There's a bus station there. Can't students work from there? What are the new universities going to be about? Our local policy plan talks about building upon the regional pool and protecting that environment. Are we refitting the regional pool? Are we really collapsing it and moving it to a car park? I think the time is right to hold capital expenditure, and that includes capital expenditure on car parks in particular. Giving people and developers money to build things on the embankment may be good. There may be better ways of doing it and creating local wealth. But be careful because people will be coming and asking you to pay for a football stadium there next. We've got no money for car parks, for this. Put it on hold for a few weeks. Stick to your promises. You said capital expenditure was on hold. Are there any other speakers? Councillor Fitzgerald. Um, it's not entirely accurate what Councillor Murphy is saying and others are saying. The position is this. We have a capital budget, we're trying to reduce it, but we wouldn't reduce or not spend on something that made us money because that's the whole point in supporting our budget. I think Councillor Coles explained very clearly this is not costing any money, but the failure to do it affects the viability of the university. So I don't understand what the issue is. So I want to be perfectly clear with you about where we are. So if a scheme comes along, and somebody just said the football club, for argument's sake, okay, I didn't mention it, you mentioned it. But just like the Hilton Hotel, or any other proposition that is put to the council that sees a commercial return for the council that is fully secured and guaranteed, we would be stupid not to take the advantage of making profit or money for the council to support our budget. So Delux, if that's what we ought to call them now, will look at any proposition the council puts to it, but not one that incurs more costs. And it's not accurate to say either that we haven't made savings, because if there was an original capital cost of £2 million for this, and it's now 500000 the savings are in the projected revenue costs, which would have been carried in the budget, which would come out of the budget if the capital cost is reduced. It's simple mathematics. Let me tell you also, show me where there's a plan, a proposal, to close the regional pool. Yes, there's been some discussion about investing in a pool, but we could not justify spending £37 million on a new pool. So at the moment, there is no plan that is listed in any of our documents about closing the regional pool. There was a wish list and a suggestion and some nice pictures, but that ain't happening either, because that would cost us money. So to suggest otherwise, this is a no-brainer. 
Councillor Cole says this does not cost us any money. Mr Carpenter will have attested to that, and we took this through the proper processes, and if it were costing us money, we'd have more questions to be asking of ourselves. But it's net zero. So let's just move on, please, Mr Mayor, if we could. Right. In the absence of any other speakers, um, I'll call upon Councillor Ayres. Would you like to exercise your right to speak? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I would like to say how tremendously important it is that we proceed with this project in its entirety. Everyone here knows how important this new university is to our city, both now and in the future, and to increase the unacceptably low skills that are in this city at the moment. We do want to progress. We do want to build this university. We have got £20 million granted to us under the Luff bid. We were successful in that. And at the time, I thought that everybody was extremely pleased about that, as I was, in fact, most excited. Uh, Councillor Sanford. Yeah, I, I just, you know, we've, we've been told by Councillor Fitzgerald and Councillor Ayres that we're threatening the viability of the university. Could he? I can't. Could he? Could could either of them explain how not building an extremely large car park threatens the, 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 the viability of the university, which all of us support? Um, I'm happy to just come back momentarily because I, I, I did make the first comment, Mr. Mayor. It is okay. not me that is a judging it necessary. Speak to the university project team. It is they that are requesting this. So ask them how critical it is to their development. I believe them and I buy into that. That's what I meant. And it's not to say we're threatening it. I'm saying how important it is to them and their development. And if that changes, then we're undermining what they believe is critical to their way forward. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Ayres, please continue. If I, if I can just continue to, to explain that having got this £20 million out of £26 million, having got that and the, money, that, the £6 million coming from elsewhere as well to build this third building, which will not just be for the students, it will also be for communities, for the cultural hub, etc., going forward for this, this city, we do not want to do anything, in my opinion, that doesn't protect that money, that doesn't protect us going forward, and the bid has to be effected within a certain period of time, or we will lose it. We cannot afford to waste time on this. We went forward knowing that there was a strict time limit on it, and we can fall within that, but we do need to comply with what the planners will want, which is that there's got to be some car parking for this university, and this is how we plan to do it, and actually both save money and invest to save money in order to get this car park going. It, the, the two go together, in other words. And so I would recommend, if I possibly can, to everyone that we go forward with this, because it has, it has been established, and everyone here has known about it, when we went forward for the Luff bid as well. So that, that is, is my suggestion, is that we all vote for this and let it proceed, as it will cost us no money. Thank you. Councillor Heller, can you sum up? Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. I've listened um, closely to everything that's been said, and I listen particularly to um, uh, Councillor Fitzgerald and, and Councillor Coles, and Councillor Ayres, of course. But it, it, the university is very important for our city. Let, let's make no question of that. And, and when uh, you know we, we have uh, commentary from Councillor Murphy that we need to put things on hold, and I'm, I'm sure I misheard him, but he said something about students working from a bus station. Um, I, I'm sure I misheard that, so you'll excuse me if I did, but that's what it sounded like to me. Um, this is all fag packet stuff, Councillor Murphy. We need to do it properly. We are doing it properly. Um, a, a cursory visit a cursory drive down Bishop's Road, you'll see just the, pr the progress that's already been made on this city's 
university. It's very, very important. And as Councillor Fitzgerald has said, the, the element, the car park element, over 120 spaces, is a very important element of that progress. And I, I just, you know, it's cost neutral. We've been told that. I have no reason to doubt that. Um, and it's very important that we approve this this evening for our city's future, for our city's university's can, future. Can, can no, I, Sam I, I, point of we've just been, we've been told several times over that this doesn't cost us £500,000, it's actually cost neutral. I've just been reading the report. I cannot find any paragraph in the report where it explains how it's cost neutral. So perhaps you just explain which paragraph in the report actually says that. Councillor Hiller. Uh, I wasn't actually referring to the report, Mr Mayor. I was referring to the information and advice that I'd received, we all received, from Councillor Coles. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Right. Um, there's, is there agreement? No. So we shall be moving to the vote. Over to Rachel. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillors, we are now voting on the Cabinet recommendation regarding the University. So all those in favour, please raise your green cards. And Dan and Pippa are going to count. Thank you. We got it done. Oh. Counted? Yeah. Yeah. All those against, red cards, please. Thank you. Any abstentions? No. Nope. Thank you. The result is 49 in favour, 9 against. There were no abstentions. Therefore, this is agreed. Thank you. Right. We'll uh, move on to agenda item 9B, which is a budget control report for August 2021. Uh, it's in relation to capital budget environments and a review budget environment. Information on the vis this can be found in the agenda pack. Councillor Coles, would you therefore like to move the recommendation? Thank you, Mr Mayor, and yes, I would like to move the recommendation. This is the August report and the third financial monitoring report of 21-22. The overall position is a forecast break-even position, which is fantastic news. The departmental position is a forecast underspend of £3.8 million. As set out in the previous midterm financial strategy item, Cabinet, the in year requirement for capitalisation direction will reduce from its original £13.7 million amount by at least £10.5 million by the application of funds from the COVID 19 reserve, which is now not required. The main positive variances in this report are that there's £2.7 million in capital finance savings, which are due to reduced borrowing by the Council in the 2020-21 financial year. £2.5 million in financing due to the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough business rates pool being agreed for another year. An additional £1.3 million one-off amount agreed with the Council's actuary, which has resulted from the closing pension figure from the Council taking back vivacity services on the 30th of September, and the underlying pension surplus figure at that time. £1.2 million from the government sales fees and charges compensation scheme. There's £1.1 million from increased wholesale export process of electricity, 
produced by our energy recovery facility. There's also been a favourable variance of half a million pounds in the Aragon Direct Services trading position. The negative variances are a £1.3 million loss in parking income, obviously because of COVID and the lack of um, visitors to the city centre, and equally a £1.1 million loss of income in relation to our culture and leisure services for the same reason. In addition, there's been £1.8 million increase from children's commissioning and family safeguarding and the early help services. And there's been an additional half a million pounds of expenditure in housing services. Turning to business rates and council tax, updated bills have now been issued to the retail, hospitality and leisure sectors, reflecting the reliefs changing to 66% from the 1st of July. However, due to these bills being issued in August and other factors, we're a bit behind on business rates collection. That's 11.8% behind target. The £11.5 million outstanding deficit reported for the 2020-21 financial year has now been reduced by 58% and it's now just a shade under £5 million at £4.8 million. Council tax income collection is 0.12% ahead of target for 2021-22. This is despite um, the fact of... Um, excuse me, of, of local council... Sorry, I beg your pardon, I just missed a page. A local council tax support caseloads arising. Since the start of the pandemic, an additional 380 households are receiving support. That's a 5% rise. There are now 8,051 local council tax support claims being supported. When we look at our reserves, we're expecting a reduction of to 31.2 million by the end of 21-22. And this includes the application of the 10.5 million pounds from the COVID-19 reserve which will offset our capitalisation direction requirements. We said much today about the capital programme, as at the 1st of April it was £151.4 million, and officers have worked extremely hard to reduce that programme to £92.9 million. However, it's worth bearing um, notice that the spend to the end of August is only £16.7 million, which is 18% of the expect expected to spend. The pro rata level would be 42%. Now, the report requests and re recommends capital environments which have been outlined in, in Appendix C. That includes 1.577 million for Clare Lodge refurbishment. Now, that's uh, third-party funding, so that's going to be cost-neutral to the Council. And that comes from um, education. There's 1.5 million contribution to the Highways Agency for the A14 Improvement Scheme. That payment is taking place at 60,000 a year for 25 years from 2020-21. Now this is funded from our community infrastructure levy and this goes back to 2014 uh, when we came into an agreement before the combined authority was developed to, to talk about the regional transport needs. So a, a whole number of councils surrounding the A14 area all chipped in to ensure that we got a major funding from central government to be able to improve the A14. So that's dating back to 2014 but we're now having to pay and of course that's a legal obligation so we will be paying that and as has been said the revenue budget environment is, is outlined in section 5.5 so um, I recommend that the council approve these two particular recommendations thank you Mr Mayor thank you Councillor Fitzgerald will you second the recommendations either speaking now or talking later I'm happy to second this recommendation and reserve my right to speak, Mr. Mayor. Are there any other speakers? We'll start with Councillor Hogg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> uh, so I, I've, I have, in, fair, in all fairness, I've, I've already um, pointed this out uh, at another meeting that was um, not in the public domain. Um, so I just wanted to put it on record that. Um, I feel that the documentation that, that surrounds this, we're, we're being asked uh, to approve um, 1.577 million on Clare Lodge, 1.5 million uh, as our contribution to the Highways Agency. Uh, specifically, the one about Clare Lodge, I, I feel that the documentation does not, um, is not really supported here for, for members to make a, a correct um, and, and fully informed decision. Um, it refers back to a decision um, that um, it has different wording, has, has a different total to it, um, it, it aligns to, to, to um, 
there being seven stages and then when asked the question it came back that it was actually eight pages uh, sorry eight stages so I, I think that as a council we need to do a lot you know we've been tasked very clearly um, on making sure that members across the board all eight all 60 of us um, need to have ownership of the, the figures that we're, we're, we're seeing um, and, and, and being a critical friend to, to the administration uh, to, to see what savings can be made. But in order to do that, we need to be able to um, find our way through the, 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 the paperwork that is put before us um, in, in an easy manner so that we, are, you know, we, we can be better informed. And, and I've been assured that that, that process will start uh, very shortly, um, and I, I welcome that going forward. Um, I just wanted to sort of touch on the, you know, this this 1.5 million um, thing from from seven years ago. I'm not, it, it says DFT. I'm not sure if it's is it DFS. You know, you, you buy now, start paying in seven years' time, um, uh, in in nice, uh, uh, you know, uh, instalments. But, but you know, if this is something that we've already signed up and agreed to seven years ago, why, why are we now being asked to make a decision on it? If, if the decision has already been made, then you know, why is it before us? If the decision hasn't been made, then you know, given our, our you know, financial situation at the moment, um, are we, you know, in, in all fairness, seven years ago, um, the council leader signed up for this process because we could afford it at that time. We can't afford this. You know, this is you know the, the you know the the times of money rolling out of the, you need the to coffers. Up, so Sorry, um, fifteen seconds. I, I just I just think that you know we need to have a, a a step change in our thinking in terms of the money that we're spending out um, because we need to look after the citizens of this this uh, this city. And and I just wanted to also make the point of these cost neutral um, things where you know we've had it before with M Power. Where you know that was put before us, Councilor and it was, a, it was a great deal, and it was all going to work. You're and over your time. Sorry, thank you. I think Thanks. I've made my thank point you. anyway. Councillor Joseph. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, obviously, it's very nice to hear that we're at a cost-neutral, uh, sorry, a forecast to break-even position. But obviously, we've got a lot of hard work to do in order to um, sustain that going forward, and. As has been said by other groups, we at the Labour Group have committed to the Financial Sustainability Working Group on the basis that the administration and officers are open, transparent and honest with us. And we did receive that commitment from uh, Chief Executive last night that that will be the case. In view of the recommendations um, that we've outlined within this re uh, piece of paper, we've got one about uh, Westcombe Industries, which as someone who's worked closely and seen the uh, work that they do with adults with special needs particularly, I'm pleased to see that this funding is going forward. However, based on the um, cap on spending, are we, are we going to get a genuine recommendation that this particular funding is going to go forward? And also coming back to the point that uh, Councillor Hogg raised about the uh, contribution to the highways agency which was promised seven years ago and therefore must go ahead uh, Millfield was promised seven and a half million uh, approximately seven years ago can we have a com commitment that that will then therefore go ahead or is that under a different um, umbrella thank you thank you no other speakers I shall ask Councillor Fitzgerald would you like to exercise your right to speak uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, c I could say lots here, um, but I've decided not to, actually, um, because I've had all these conversations, as is pointed out, not in private, um, I suppose, well, not secret, but just on the Empower thing, I would remind people criticising about Empower, it's made us a lot of money, actually. So, um, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know what the problem is with that, personally, but there we go. Um, I, I, and I won't embarrass Liberal Democrats or anybody else or officers about the shortcomings of paperwork. It's been noted and we uh, are all working together to fix it. Thank you. And Councillor Coles, would you like to sum up? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Yes, I, I think it's, as it's clear, we've, 
We're in, we're in a very advantageous position at the moment in, in break-even. I have taken on board the concerns from the Liberal Democrat group and also from our, our Labour colleagues about making sure that the information that's received is a bit clearer and I'm going to be doing my best to make sure that happens. And if there is any concern at any time, please come directly to me and I will get you the answer. I do have full explanation for all of these and as we said, it, they're not going to cost us any money because they're either investor save or they come from third party funding. So if I can reassure you in brief, it's not going to cost us any more. Um, however, I've got the full detail. If you wish it, I'm very happy to write and, and give you that information. Um, otherwise, I'd, I'd recommend that uh, we approve the, the two recommendations before us tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Are we in agreement on this one? No, no, I hear no dissent. So we'll take that as agreed. Thank you. Now, members, I think we'll take a comfort break now. Um, and with the tea and coffee available, uh, I think we'll make it 20 minutes. Um, back at 25 past, thank you.
Moving on then, agenda item 10, questions on executive decisions made since the last meeting. This is in relation to record of executive decisions, details on pages 61 to 68 of your agenda pack. The leader will introduce this item and any questions will be answered by the leader, unless he refers them to another member. I would remind the councillors that they should ask questions on the decisions in the reports. All questions should be relevant to the decision itself. Should I feel that any preamble is unreasonably long, I instruct councillors to ask their question immediately. Can members please note that once <coughs> I've moved on, questions will not be accepted from previous pages. So, Councillor Fitzgerald, would you please introduce the item? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. I'm happy to introduce this uh, report on all executive de decisions made since the last meeting of full council. I will direct, as you said, any questions members have to the appropriate cabinet member or answer them myself. As members will see from the report, decisions covered include the shareholder cabinet committee meeting in September, the cabinet meetings in or meeting in October, and a range of cabinet member decisions taken between July and October. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. So I'm going to take each page in turn, and can members please refer to the title or reference number of the decision when asking a question. Page 61. Page 62, 63, 64, 65, Councillor Murphy, thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I refer to Cabinet Member Decision Notice 28 nominations to outside bodies. My question is about, it says West Rav Community Association, Stafford Hall Management. There's the Management Committee and there's also the trustees of the trading company. Is this actually an error? Because I know I had, a, I had correspondence um, with officers about Stafford Hall and round about that time, the council were rene renegotiating um, a temporary lease arrangement with an interested party who have used the building for functions since. However, for most of this year, the building has been closed to members of the public and for hiring and for bookings. It's exasperated because we lost St. John's Hall in the ward as well, and another one a few years before. So would it not be appropriate to have a council representative on the management committee to help with the future of Stafford Hall. Councillor Fitzgerald. Uh, thank you, Mr. Councillor Murphy, I should say. Um, I will get uh, one of the officer team, it'll probably be Adrian Chapman, to come back to you with the details. The recommendations were put to me. I understand it's uh, recent, more recently as well, had a bit of a checkered history with uh, the management collapsing of, of that particular uh, uh, venue, Councillor Murphy. So if there are some questions unanswered, uh, happy to get those answers for you from Adrian Chapman. Um, and indeed, uh, I think Democratic Services uh, put the issue to me in terms of uh, our representation on those boards. And, it, and if there is a need to revisit it, I'll happily do that. But obviously, I took advice from uh, the team about what we need to do in the short term. But I think perhaps if you want an update, uh, either directly through me or I would ask that Adrian Chapman, I don't know if he's still here, but if an officer can make a note about uh, updating Councillor Murphy on what's happening with the Stafford Hall uh, Committee and Management and the trustees side of it as well, please. Thank you. Last call for page 65. And Thank Councillor Hogg. Just a quick question, sorry. Uh, it's just to, to, to do with the street uh, light dimming um, uh, decision i just wanted to know is are we are we stopping there at 40 percent are we looking uh, to see if there are maybe other elements that that could you know where it could be produced further or it could be reduced prior to to midnight um, i know when it it seems that the the lighting contrast so that the darker it is the, uh, the the less light is needed um 
So, you know, in the, in the early hours, you need uh, stronger lighting to, to be able to, to light. It seems a bit odd, but it seems to me that when it's really dark, it doesn't need to be quite so bright. Um, I just wondered if, if, if that, that's an ongoing thing. Sorry. Are we looking to, to reduce it further? Uh, I think it's called Lux, I believe, but Peter Hiller would be the man to answer the question. Yeah, I'm more than happy to, to answer that. I, I think your question was, um, is, it, is it ongoing? Um, and the answer to that is <coughs> yes, it is ongoing. Um, are the streetlights um, going to be dimmed further? No. No, they're not. Um, the, the reason for the decision initially was not just to save money, it was also about less light pollution and it was also about less carbon emissions. So it's a, a, a sort of a, a triple win for us. It, it's, you know, our officers reviewed the programme in detail. We had a trial, you'll be aware, Councillor Hogg, um, post-pandemic um, where the traffic levels were very low. We, we could yeah, afford, inverted commas, to, to keep the lights fairly dim. The, the potential risk, though, from, from an insurance claim point of view, is something we're very conscious of. And the British standard on lighting it determines that although it's not statutory to provide street lighting, if you do provide street lighting, the, the, the British standards determine that you need to do it to a certain level. We, we are at a level which is comparable with other local authorities. We're quite confident that what we're doing is the right thing. Um, and this, this particular decision was also about the timings of those lights being dimmed in residential areas and main arterial routes. So I, I hope that answers your question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Moving on to page 66. Councillor Sanford. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. My question is about the cycling and walking member working group proportionality. Um, the Local Government Act requires, across the totality of all the main committees of the council, that uh, a, a proportionality needs to be achieved. There's nothing in the Local <coughs> Government Act or in the council constitution saying that working groups need to be proportional. And the tradition in all the time I've been on this council is that working groups were composed of one member of each group. So could the leader t tell me where this concept has come from, that working groups need to be pr proportional? Um, <laughs> it's slightly confusing on our paperwork tonight, so if you're asking me about uh, uh, me personally, in terms of the subject matter comes under um, somebody else, but okay. Uh, I originally thought about how I wanted to see working groups operate um, within the council, and I originally made a decision to put uh, a, a, a finite number on them, which was five, I believe. And I then was lobbied and had representations made to me by other political parties. And it seemed to me that the fairest way to do it was to make it proportional rather than uh, and, and, re and reflect the p political makeup of the council. Nothing more than that. Uh, now, it may not have been normal or what we're used to, but I don't see what's wrong with it. So I consulted with... Uh, the chief executive on how I might accommodate Councillor Howell's request so that all members felt included and not excluded from anything. And it seemed to me that the best way to do it in order to be fair and balanced about representative views across the council was to have it proportional to the political makeup. And I thought that was a sensible way forward. Thank you, Councillor Hogg. Uh, will you once come back? Yeah, I, I do, because, um, so it was, what he's saying is it was nothing to do with the, with the fact that he was trying to manipulate the composition of the committee to, to, to actually t t take off it, the, the chairman who, who was asking, who, who, was, who was actually asking um, some awkward questions. And I, can I just ask a supplementary question, though? Um, the, you know, I'm actually now on this group. I, I'm not sure that was a question. That was an accusation, Mr. Mayor, which I'd like you to withdraw that, Nick. But that was my opinion, Councillor mm, Fitzgerald. It sounded so more like an accusation to me. 
And that was my opinion as to what would happen. And I was telling you, in which case, though, Mr. Mayor, I, I will answer my, that. No, it I wasn't. I withdraw my opinion, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. It was a completely unsubstantiated allegation. I, I withdraw it. But can I just ask, I'm now on this committee as a Liberal Democrat re 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 representative. The, m the Department for Transport and the Mayor of Cambridgeshire have severely criticised Peterborough City Council for misuse of, of active travel funds in respect of what happened on the Crescent Bridge. Can you tell me why this um, group has not held any meetings to talk about the important issues that the Mayor of Cambridgeshire has now? Uh, as I'm highlighted. Well, again, I would refute the first part of your statement as entirely inaccurate. That is not true. I have spoken to the minister myself, Chris Heaton Harris, when he visited Peterborough, and there has been some vocal, um, shall we say, uh, outrage by a small minority of people making a lot of noise. The vast majority of people uh, either don't care or not really bothered about it because my post bag or inbox is not full of those people. But nonetheless, to say that the DFT have been critical of one scheme, that is inaccurate. What the DFT have wanted through the combined authority who provided the funding was a reassurance of our commitment to uh, cycling and walking and providing the infrastructure. I've gone on record publicly that that is my intention also, but I don't want half cockamamie schemes that haven't been consulted upon, costed, or worked out. What I want is permanent schemes that may take some time to develop, and I know that our team is working on those schemes, for you, so for you to state that, Councillor Sanford, is inaccurate. And the Mayor has also been asked to give an undertaking about the combined authorities' commitment to the same position, which he has done. What the DFT and the Minister uh, did was as a result of the very small minority making a lot of noise, put in jeopardy for a Can short period of time Council the funding Gerald. because it would seemingly undermine the position. That has now been clarified. Right. I'm um, going to move on, Councillor Hogg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> uh, so my question was also um, really kind of uh, around the, the cycling and walking um, uh, group. And I, I, I just want to kind of um, maybe ask the leader or the, 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 the cabinet, um, the deputy leader, it says here, made the, the decision. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure, sure who made the decision, um, but, but I, I think it sets a, a dangerous precedent insofar as that, you know, my understanding of working groups is one that it, it's not particularly one that's political. It's about um, parties coming together to, to, to share ideas, to, to get the best possible outcomes, to be able to then um, make yes. recommendations. Councillor Hogg, what's your question? It's, it's just coming. It's just coming. Making recommendations. Not be the same as Councillor Sanford's. Sorry? Come on. Okay. So, um, essentially, you've, you've kind of taken my thought away here, but I, I will continue nonetheless. Sorry. Um, so, essentially, it has no decision-making power. It goes back to the Cabinet. It goes back to a committee to make recommendations. And I just think that what you end up doing is having 11 people in the room rather than five, where you can actually have a much better conversation. And certainly that is my experience. Um, so I, I just wondered, is this a one-off or is this something that you're going to be doing across working groups? Uh, I would apply the same principle as a matter of fairness to, work, to all the other working groups. And I've already adopted the same policy with the EDDI working group as well. Again, to try to be inclusive, but also, you know, look, let's not <coughs> try and hide this. This council and the way we operate is a political machine. We cooperate where we can and we all do what we can together where we find common ground. But inevitably there are circumstances where we, we may share different ideology. And I want that ideology and, and that thinking to be reflected fairly across the political makeup of the council. And if that ever changes, Councillor Hogg, you can do it the way you want to do it. But until it changes, we're doing it the way I want to do it and the way my group wants to do it, which is the way it's laid out in the uh, position about proportionality. Right, page 67. Councillor Sanford. Yeah, just a quick question on the Oxcam Growth Art Spatial Consultation. Um, the, one of the problems that happened there was the draft 
consultation response was published at such a late point that if, if members had been unhappy with it and wanted to call it in, the effect of calling it in would have mean that the council could not have submitted the consultation on the 12th of October, so wouldn't have been able to comment at all. So can we have an assurance with future consultations that the, that the consultation response will be prepared and, and published at such a point that if, if necessary, it can be taken through the call-in pr um, process. Councillor Fitzgerald. Uh, sorry, Mr. Mayor, I was, I, I, was, I was expecting something else from Councillor Sanford as a follow-on. Councillor Hiller will pick that one up. Thank you. <laughs> it, appears, it appears Councillor Councillor Fitzgerald was fixated on you, uh, Councillor Sanford. So, be still your beating heart. Um, well, she was fixated on the, on the Queen, but was slightly misdirecting his gaze. If, if, if I might. Um, yeah, yes, you do have that assurance, actually. Uh, I was quite heavily involved in this uh, initial response um, to the uh, one of three consultations. It, it, it's a three-tier effect. Of course, the initial consultation of you know, something of this size, the, the Oxcam arc, as an as a, as a economic growth area, um, you know, patently that is going to be a, a fairly broad brush affair. Um, the, the perhaps more significant consultations will be two and three. Um, it, it was uh, brought forward fairly swiftly, I have to say. It wasn't by design that it couldn't be, you know, called in or, or whatever. But um, I, I hope there was no issues. I mean, you talked about the date of the consultation response, but I hope there was no issues with the consultation response. I, I went through it line by line, and I thought it was a particularly well-crafted response by our officers, um, making all the salient points that were relevant to Peterborough City. I see you're <coughs> nodding, so I hope that's, that's a sign of acceptance. Um, yes, of, of course, we want in inclusivity with regard to any consultation of this import, and I would say that um, it, it is an extremely important uh, scheme is probably too uh, mild a word. It, it is a transformation of this particular area, which is which is huge, of course. So uh, my answer to that is yes. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Um, my question is on Cabinet Member Decision Notice 36, uh, Commissioning of Domestic Abuse Refuge Provision. Would you agree with me that sometimes when the contracts get bigger, it excludes? local organizations and operators um, are providing and delivering things locally and putting that money back into the local economy, maybe having a living wage or whatever. And on this one, I think Peterborough Women's Aid have been providing services in Peterborough for 40 years now. Will they be able to continue to do that under this or not? Councillor Allen, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> Yeah, thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. I don't have a specific answer to that. I imagine this is all down to economy of scale. And, of course, we do co cooperate with the Cambridgeshire County Council on many things. So perhaps if you have a specific question to me, for me, as you've indicated, I can investigate and come back to you, Councillor Murphy. Thank you. Thank you. And page 68. Councillor Wiggins. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. My question is on the um, Cabinet Member Decision 42, the purchase of new passenger transport coaches. Um, it says in the decision notice that the decision not to go for any alternatives, um, such as electric or um, even um, less polluting um, diesel alternatives, uh, was due to the cost. Um, but given we're in a climate emergency, waiting to 2030 to replace these um, vehicles with cleaner vehicles is too late. Um, so does this mean that when it comes to the decision makings on purchasing vehicles such as this, that money is more important than the climate? Uh, Councillor Ayers will pick this one up, I hope. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you very much for asking a question on one of my decision notices because they're very rare. <laughs> I don't seem to have very interesting ones, but I'm delighted that this one is. Um, the, the principle behind this really was to save money, definitely to save money. It's going to save something like £15,000 per month. 
and using these vehicles that we already know are okay vehicles. I don't know that, but Councillor Simon behind me definitely does. <laughs> and and so that was the, that we had that choice because we're not in a position yet to buy electric vehicles at this stage. That's what we plan to do. It says so in the CMDN as well. It, go, it says, um, uh, satisfied, combined with the need to meet the Council's carbon commitments by 2030, which will require investment in electric vehicles by that date. Now, we shall be doing that, I imagine, as soon as we can, but that's not now, I'm afraid, not at this very moment. And so these vehicles, we shall save on maintenance as well, because we can maintain them ourselves. We know the vehicles. And that's the reason why we're going forward with it. Because, and the reason why I have it is because it is within the children's situation and transporting children to school. So thank you for asking the question. Thank you. And one from Councillor Hogg. Um, so this is um, a question on the, on the same decision, although I think um, Councillor Simons might be better placed to answer <laughs> the question. Uh, and that, that is basically... Um, Will these coaches be able to use your new super duper low carbon fuel uh, that you're using on your bin lorries? Yeah, we're hopeful that we can use the HVO fuel on these vehicles going forward. Obviously, it's still out to trial, but if it works well with our refuge vehicles and highways, we certainly will be using it. Right, all done. Agenda item 11. Questions on the combined authority decisions made since their last meeting. This is in relation to the record of their decisions detailed on pages 72 to 116 of your agenda pack. I will refer any questions to the relevant combined authority representative. I would remind councillors that they should ask questions on the decisions in the report appendices. All questions should be relevant to the decision itself. Should I feel that any preamble is unreasonably long, I will instruct councillors to ask their question immediately. I will take each appendix in turn, and council members please refer to the title of the decision when asking a question. So appendix one on pages 72 to 76. Appendix two, pages 77 to 82, councillor Sanford. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my question is on 80, page 80, and, it, and it's actually item 8 at the bottom of the page, business board format of meetings. Um, when I was on the Audit and Governance Committee of the Combined Authority, um, one of the, the issues that we came across was that the business board of the Combined Authority was meeting predominantly in private. So we made a recommendation to the to the board of the combined authority and to the business board that they should have a presumption that they should meet in public. So could one of the representatives on the combined authority please um, pass my congratulations and I, and I hope the congratulations of the council onto the on to, on to the board that, 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 that it, it is now going to be a presumption that where they're, where they're making decisions for spending tens of millions of pounds of public funds they will have a presumption that those meetings will be held in public Is that Councillor Shaznawas? I'll be more than happy to pass on Councillor Sanford's comments to the committee Mayor Thank you very much Appendix 3, pages 83 to 85. Appendix 4, pages 87 to 91. Appendix 5, pages 93 to 95. Appendix 6, pages 97 to 104. Councillor Sanford. Thank you, Mayor. My, thank you, Mr. Mayor. My, my question is on page 100, um, item 3.1 of the Combined Authority Scrutiny Committee, I think it is. Um, the, um, the, the item on the CAM. Um, the Leader of the Council um, made a couple of remarks earlier on ab about the fact that the current Mayor of Cambridgeshire has decided that, I think for quite good reasons, that the CAM project isn't going to continue. But I understand that there was a feasibility study being carried out for the possibility of having a light rail or tramway system in 
Peter Barra. So um, could the combined authority representatives enlighten me as to what the plans are for replacement of the CAM and, and particularly replacement with something that is going to be of great benefit to Peterborough. Councillor Fitzgerald. Uh, the Mayor doesn't have one. Simple as that. Right. Appendix 7, pages 105 to 107. And Appendix 8, pages 109 to 116. So moving on to Agenda Item 12, Motions on Notice. These can be found on pages 117 to 120 of your agenda packs. And the first one being from Councillor Murphy in relation to the licensing of sex establishments. Councillor Murphy, I understand that you wish to move a motion without notice prior to the debate on this motion. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Understanding Order 21D, I move that this motion be referred to the Licensing Committee. Thank you. And uh, I think it's Councillor Imtiaz Ali. Uh, are you seconding this? And if so, do you wish to speak now or reserve your right to speak later in the debate? Uh, yeah, I'm seconding and I'll reserve my right to speak. Thank you. Any speakers, sir? Councillor Wigan. Um, so just confirm, Mr. Madis, is on the procedural motion. Or the motion. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm opposed to the um, procedural motion to move to uh, refer to licensing committee because I'm opposed to the motion as a whole, and I don't think um, once we've had a debate at this council, it will need referring to licensing committee. Um, I mean, I want to talk later about why I'm opposed to the motion, but I don't think it's the council's place to impose uh, moral standards on a licensing decision, and that is what, in effect, this um, this, mo this motion does um, in licensing committee. And we had a recent example when um, the um, renewal of the license for the one uh, established um, sex establishment in Peterborough came up that a lot of the objections to that were based on moral grounds which are not licensing reasons for refusal and I think that's where this is going and that's not grounds for the licensing committee to look at. Thank you and apologies. Um, I think I've got the order a debate here wrong. Just raise think... a point of order Mr Mayor. Just, just want to clarify what's going to happen here because if the council votes to reject the procedural motion do we then proceed to have a d debate on the on the on the proposal itself yeah if councillor murphy moves the motion at that stage then yes yeah. okay in 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 okay yeah so, yep councillor murphy uh, perhaps i can help mr mayor i didn't hear what the monitoring officer said um but i was hoping that this was procedural motion would mean there would be no debate if you are minded to have a debate on it then I will simply move that the motion not be put I think it's more appropriate that this goes to licensing and while I'm speaking there was no licensing committee meeting recently that discussed any sex establishment in Peterborough it wasn't actually correct what the councillor said thank you C Councillor Murphy, are you, are you willing to withdraw that then? Councillor Hiller. Oh, Councillor Hiller with another point. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, am I allowed to, is it a point of, point of information um, in, in that what Councillor Murphy has just said is completely untrue? I, I was at that licensing committee meeting when this very same establishment had failed to renew their um, license in time and so had to apply for a new license um, and that was debated at length and uh, Councillor Wigan is absolutely right. Um, may I, may I apologise then, I was at the last licensing committee well, you said, we you said recent, discussed something not else completely. Well that's, that's you mangling the syntax isn't it? Um, and, and it was discussed at length and, and the, the objections were thank moral you. objections, they weren't licensing policy objections. Right, thank, thank you Mr Mayor. Thank you. 
So, Councillor Murphy, over to you. Will you withdraw and move the original? Um, uh, it sounds as though that, that there is um, some people is here that don't want this referred yeah. to licensing committee. It wasn't discussed at the last licensing committee meeting. So in no circumstances, so we don't have to debate tonight, I wish not to move the motion. So, so Councillor Murphy, are you not moving the motion to refer to licensing committee? Motion without I, notice. I, I've second guessed that people wanted to have a debate and they'd start talking about things other than that, like moral or not. Therefore, I'm moving a step ahead and actually withdrawing the motion from tonight's order paper. Okay. Um, right. Not you. putting it. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. That's withdrawn. Move on to the next motion, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, which is from, uh, from Councillor John Fox. The motion is in relation to A&E patients in custody. Councillor John Fox, please would you move your motion. Thank you, Mr Mayor. <clears throat> First of all, I've spoken to several uh, ex-police officers, two of which in this um, chamber tonight, and other serving police officers and ex-police officers, and they see no problem with my motion, and they think they were, someone was quite shocked that this was going on, actually. Uh, my own experience recently was, unfortunately, me and Judy have had to go down to A&E several times. Uh, and on one occasion, well, quite often you saw police officers down there, but on one occasion there was a chap who was in custody, who was cuffed, and uh, two police officers with him. He kicked up. Uh, they wrestled him to the floor. Two security guards come. Uh, he kicked out, nearly uh, kicked the legs of an elderly gentleman who was sat in one of the chairs. Uh, he was subdued, taken in, put in the van and brought out later on. We went in and got uh, treatment, uh, came out and the officers were still there and it was about five hours, four to five hours, uh, which to me, I'm not asking for the, the police to jump the queue for obvious reasons, as obviously there's going to be more serious cases there like road traffic accidents, heart attacks and I'm not asking for that. But in the old days, and I can talk about the old days with 23 years of experience, with the old PDH, we used to go to accident and emergency, and there was the main door, and you went to the left if you was a, a patient or a customer, whatever you want to call them, and to the right if you was emergency services, and there was a room set aside. And the reason for that was you, you placed the person in there, and then you went to the sister, who was then the triage nurse, explain what the situation was, and they uh, used, what's the word I'm looking for, not, they used their um, skill and judgment and tried to deal with them as quick as possible. Obviously, putting other people before if they were more serious. Um, during the tr triage process, I asked if there's any way that could be assessed at this stage and give some form of priority like it used to be. And I know it's difficult, and I know it was very busy in the city compared to what we were, but there has to be a way. I do believe, though, that no matter what the, their needs are, there needs to be a room set aside for several reasons. One is the safety of other patients and the unnecessary fear or possible stress that can be caused when somebody like this particular chap did kick up. It, it alarmed quite a few people who are already in a, in a position where they don't want to be stressed, and it alarmed them some rotten, and it shouldn't be happening. Um, RTAs and other serious incidents, as a police officer, sometimes you have to relate horrible messages, as do the staff, uh, to family members. You don't want to be doing that in the reception area. There needs to be a room set aside where you can take them to break that sort of news. And I'm sure that if it came to that, the hospital would find a room, but there should be one there for that purpose. Anonymity is important also because just because people are in custody it doesn't mean they're guilty. They're innocent until proven guilty and they've probably not even been to, uh, to be charged obviously. So, you know. so that's important because I would hate to think if it was me, wrong place, wrong time and I was innocent that people in there who may live down my street see me and say, oh I saw John Fox, he was in cuffs. Not very good. Uh, also, it has, does have an adverse effect on prisoners themselves because when they're in police custody, they're going to be longer in custody because if they're down the accident emergency for several hours, 
that is meaning they're going to be spending several other hours inside the, the police station. To basically sum up, I'm not asking for much. I'm not, all I'm asking is a small room set aside for emergency services to use when necessary, away from the public's gaze for the reasons already stated. Also, some form of tri triage that would assist to get bobbies back on the beat where they're much needed. Rather than hanging around in A&E waiting rooms for most of their shift, there used to be a system in the past that worked satisfactory, but sadly over the years it seems to have sort of disappeared. Instead of saying there's no way to sort this, I believe that we should be working together to find a solution, and maybe our MPs working together with the Clinical Commissioning Group and Cambridge Constabulary can come up with a satisfactory solution. I do hope so and ask your support in my motion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Besby, I believe you're second this. Are you speaking now or reserving your right to speak later? Thank you, Mr Mayor. I am happy to second this, but I will reserve my right to speak. Thank you. Right. Uh, and for other speakers, I'll start with Councillor Hogg. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I, I think this is a, this is a great motion. Um, I think you maybe missed one little point, um, and, and that is um, prisoners from Peterborough Prison that are um, that, that are accompanied by prison officers. I think they also should be afforded this um, this facility. And it would be I, I'm not sure that it, it's too late to add it to the motion now, um, but it, it might be um, wise to to ask um, whoever writes the letter to to members of Parliament to maybe put that bit in as well. Um, and I will shut up now. Thank you. Councillor Kayyem. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, Councillor Fox, I just wanted to thank you because I find, um, I'll give the reasons why I feel I can't support this motion, but with due respect to you, I am actually quite endeared because of your good intentions. And I've seen the work that you've done from a charitable perspective for our veterans, for our forces, the support that you give to our police officers, and I actually find that very endearing. That's the first thing I'd like to say to you. I'd like to just give you a perspective of my experience as a clinician. Many people here don't know that my background is actually that of working in accident and emergency. I've worked in some of the busiest accident and emergency departments in Europe, St. Mary's Hospital in London, Leicester Royal Infirmary, um, the West Middlesex Hospital, some really, really busy A&E departments. And, and you very rightly alluded to the pressures that were faced in your own experience as well. And I'm glad to see that both you and, and Ms. Councillor Fox are, are well and are in good health. Now, I'd just like to bring to members' attention last night at our Health Scrutiny Committee meeting that we had a representative from NWAFT who gave their presentation on the winter plans. And currently, I'd just like to make everybody aware that A&E is running at 101% capacity, which is actually staggering. The winter plan strategy is to reduce the time of patients from going into A&E from the city to discharge, and they're working very hard to do that. But what I think was really interesting that has come out for the first time is that we were told that in 40 years, Northwest Anglia Foundation Trust has a deficit of healthcare assistants, and they are struggling to recruit. And we all know that healthcare assistants and nursing staff form the backbone of our A&E, and that's very important to consider. I don't think that it's practical to be able to give precedence to people in custody, and there are reasons for that. And I think that it's not practical because, number one, what you've proposed in the motion, Councillor Fox, is that we request the Director of Public Health to write to the CCG, the Clinical Commissioning Group. It actually doesn't come under the public health remit. And also, depending upon the case, two police officers are often required in many cases for patients who are in custody. And depending upon the scenario, this is to prevent further occurrences, for example, which may lead to violence, 20 seconds. absconding. Um, so it, it's not possible when you enter into A&E to try and look at that. And there is already a very, um, you know, a, 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 a credible triaging service that is taking place that has reduced waiting times 
completely. And just to give you an example, my husband's a new nose throat surgeon, and he sent me a message tonight saying, and I will quote him, it is crazy, crazy busy in here tonight, Shabina. I am working in A&E right now to try and get people off the floor, and beds are like gold dust. Thank you, Councillor Thank Cleon. you. I'll call on Councillor Hemraj. Um, I'd like to thank Councillor Fox for bringing this to attention, but essentially I did some research with my NHS colleagues that work in ED and I cannot support this. What is saying, we always try and place patients in police custody in the cubicle at times, at times this is not practical. They will be placed in the most appropriate area for their care. All patients in our ED are seen in priority order. If a, that a prisoner with a, or an arrested person with a minor injury should be ahead of a patient with a more serious condition. Prioritising patients inappropriately does not only delay one patient, it delays every patient in the department who was to be seen in priority order before said person. We now have a booking system that can be accessed through the 1-1 triage system and our own clinical navigation. There is the opportunity for custody patients to be brought back after navigation to be booked appointment if, clinical priority, if clinically appropriate. The long or shorter is we see in priority order. I cannot support it because it gives extra pressure on what is already an overstretched, busy ED department. But I do thank Councillor Fox for bringing this motion to our attention. Thank you. Councillor Howell. Thank you, Mr Mayor. And just to continue that theme, I'm also sorry, uh, Councillor Fox, that I don't feel I can support the motion either. My colleagues who work in healthcare have um, put it far more eloquently than I possibly could. I just said it in one sentence, triage decisions should be based on clinical need, and I feel that um, very strongly. Um, I'm sorry to hear that experience um, that you've had recently in A&E. I spend a lot of time in A&E, um, much more than I would like to, and um, you've made me realise often the person causing the disruption um, and, and screaming and shouting is me, so um, I'm sorry about that. But we spend a lot of time in there and a lot of pain, don't we? Um, and just to say as well, it's a matter of experience really, I and mean, I feel safer seeing the police there. Um, whenever I've seen violence um, kick off, it's, or sometimes it's between patients, um, particularly when it's late at night and people are fed up and tempers fray. Um, and having lived in London for quite a long time, um, when my partner was in a, a really serious, really, really serious accident, had to go to one of the major hospitals, police with submachine guns, it was absolutely common, uh, protecting somebody who'd been poisoned. I mean, it was, you know, that's kind of what I'm used to, so that may also have some bearing on my feelings on this. But my gut feeling is it's not something that I can support, but I also thank you for bringing the motion. Thank you. Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just interestingly, I mean, um, I can't support the motion, but having said that, Councillor, the people who are supporting the motion, I notice are ex job. And, and I can see where they're coming from. <clears throat> and like the other speakers, I have a great deal of sympathy for them. But at the present time, where I have to think about the well being of the people working in the NHS. And we just, there is an effective triaging system. And, you know, like a lot of things in the council chamber, it's hearts and heads. And this time, whilst my head understands fully what Councillor Fox is setting out to do, my heart and my head goes with the NHS. And I can't support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sanford. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we had quite an extensive discussion on this motion at the Liberal Democrat group. M meeting. Um, I actually wish that the Labour group, when they're applying their hearts and their heads, would actually apply it to read what the recommendations in the motion actually say. Now, I, I think, I, I think you know, this motion, I, and I, I actually do regret because I, I, I th point I of order, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, what, what's your point? Um, I'd just like to say that there's a huge litigation burden for those clinicians that have to neglect patients that take priority over Sorry, those patients can you in state custody. What your point so is? my point of order is that I'm actually um, slightly surprised at that comment that the Labour groups state that it's a heart's 
head it's over heart tissue. It's not a point tissue. of order, Councillor Kayon. I'm it's an opinion. To, I'm, it's not. I'm, I'm trying to factually correct the fact that, that we've got evidence to back up what we're saying. And that's my point of order. Thank you. Councillor Sanford, continue. I, I apologise if I said that in, a, in, in an apparently aggressive way. It wasn't meant like that. What, what I'm trying to say is that Liberal Democrat groups strongly support the, the, the principle that what Councillor Fox is saying. I think it's, the, the motion's not very well worded, and, and I actually think we could have maybe gone back and, and, and sort of asked for some bits of it to be reworded. Re, re, re I think the, the, the point I was making about the Labour group not reading the motion is the fact that there is a reference in, in the fourth paragraph paragraph to saying that wouldn't it be nice if these people were treated more urgently but if you look what the motion actually resolves what it says that the council is going to advocate that is not referred to so all that it says is that we, we should actually ask the, the, the director of Public health. I think it, it should probably be to liaise with the hospitals trust and not the clinical commissioning group, but to see if a room can be made available where these where these people who are accompanied by um, by um, police or by pr pr um, prison officers could be kept separately from other patients. Point of order, Mr. Mayor. Again, another factual correction, please. I've already stated that the hospital last night was quoted to be at 101% capacity, which means that there are no available rooms. Well, that's not a point of order, but I, I, I actually will respond to it. I think you know, all that Councillor Fox is saying is he's not saying in the recommendation that these people should be, tr should be treated more urgently. He's actually saying that, that, that we ask the hospital to explore whether it is possible for a separate room for security reasons and, and to protect the an anonymity of these people that they should be kept separately. Now, if, if that letter is, is actually goes forth, and the response comes back, we're so busy because of COVID, we can't do it. I'm sure Councillor Fox would accept it and I would accept it. But I just Can urge, you know, that we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater almost. Um, and just because the motion's not very well worded, I think we should support the principle of what Councillor Fox is actually advocating. Just a point of accuracy. The Trust actually says they do try to make accommodation available for those that have come arrested when there's space available. Thank you. Thank, thank. Just, just to finish the point, if, if they already do that, then actually asking them to do it isn't going to be a problem, is it? No, I don't. Anyway, let's move on, please. Councillor Coles. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I, I'm one person who has spent many a time handcuffed all night to someone in a hospital bed. So I, I have some experience in the area, and also when I was um, Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner, um, this issue was a, a very significant one. Now, we stand in the middle as a council between, on the one hand, the health service, and on the other hand, the police service. The, the reality is that the police service are forced to spend many hours not on the streets, and this is a, 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 another pressurised service, trying to bring a, a prisoner in who's been arrested, who's not been charged, to get treatment. And it may well be that they have suffered injury. It may also be that they're playing up because they might get an, an opportunity to escape. So you do need to have someone suitably trained to look after that person while they're there. Now, the motion talks about trying to find a room, and that's absolutely what I would like to see, and of course, as, as Councillor Hemorrhage has said, that's what's provided when it's available. But I think this opens the debate, and actually it will go further to say, we as a council should be getting the two different groups, NHS and police, to talk together to stop this problem of too many officers being taken to look after someone. We, we know this about mental health, for example, that officers, two officers can be sitting in an ambulance waiting for a mental health uh, place to come up. It can be six to eight hours, two officers taken out of circulation. Now, it was good to hear that, the, um, that there is some money available for, for health um, uh, staff. Perhaps it would be possible for officers to be employed so that they can simply drop off um, people who are in custody or people in mental health crisis and have them looked after appropriately. I completely understand the pressures on both organisations, but I think we as a council need to exercise our responsibility to say to both of these organisations, please try and work together to resolve this problem. And Councillor Fox very clearly identifies what you see that isn't working, that you get someone fighting in a, in a public area in a hospital, putting people potentially at risk, and we don't want to see that. So that's why I support this particular motion, but I would like to see it go further in the, in the future. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Andrew Bond. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wasn't originally planning to speak on this, but I just need a bit of clarification. From my understanding of what Councillor Fox is trying to say is, he's not asking for any priority or saying, right, you, you need to be seen first. He's just asking for a separate room, and I do appreciate we have some highly skilled and many, many people on both sides of the argument from the police and, and the um, hospital service. So I'd just like some clarification. I'm sure I'll get it, but I just wanted to make sure that clarification was put that you're not asking for priority, you're just asking for a separate space. If it's available, if it's not available and there's no room, then fair enough, and I'm sure you'll accept that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Shaznamaz. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and I'd also like to thank uh, Councillor Fox for bringing this motion to our attention, and I'm sorry to hear by the incident that he shared. Uh, I'd like to think that's uh, a, uh, an isolated case, or at least it doesn't happen that often. Uh, I'm struggling somewhat here, really, because if, on the one hand, we're saying a room is available, uh, if uh, it's free, uh, then I don't see why we're putting forward a motion to ask for something like that to happen if it already exists. Uh, and I appreciate uh, Councillor Sanford saying, well, if, if the room exists, then we're just asking them to use it. Uh, well, if that's already happening, Councillor Sanford, uh, I can't see the point of uh, asking them to do what they are already doing. I do, however, agree with you, Councillor Fox, that there needs to be a certain amount of decency and confidentiality uh, offered to uh, the people being escorted by the police. Uh, and I also share your concern and sentiments uh, in terms of police officers being taken uh, off, their, off the streets or, or perhaps uh, spending more time in hospital. But uh, if that is a concern, which I'm sure it is for you, uh, I think it would be nice for you to possibly add something here in terms of more resources and funding for the police and furthermore, more resources and funding for the NHS so that they can have further resource uh, to attend to such matters as you've highlighted in this particular motion. And Councillor Sanford, uh, thank you for pointing out that you feel that the Labour Group haven't properly or fully read the motion, but knowing you as I do, I'll set aside that comment. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. I have two more listed and then we'll go to summing up. Uh, Councillor Murphy. Yes, thank you. Maybe Councillor Fox will deal with it in his summing up. Um, I'm just wondering, because we're not clear what this motion really means, um, whether in this case it's something where we should use standing order 21D and refer it to the appropriate scrutiny <coughs> committee or to cabinet to get that clarity. Because on the one hand, people might be thinking, if this happens, even though it may not actually say that as written, it could mean that clinical decisions will be overrided and somebody having a heart attack could suffer a fatality because somebody who the police service want to escort back to the mental assessment centre or something, but now it's on site, it shouldn't take too long, um, is, is being treated ahead of them. So I'm wondering whether we may want to um, refer this to the relevant scrutiny committee so that debate can be had there and maybe something come up. Because I don't think it, th th there's division about trying to get the best thing. It's just we don't actually understand exactly what's being asked of us, or some of us don't. All right, thank you. So Walsh? I don't know whether Councillor Fox wants to move um, 21D or anybody else does. I'm just suggesting it as a possibility to move on. Um, Taking question from Councillor Walsh. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't want to prolong the debate um, unnecessarily, but I just did want to point out the business of um, uh, one of my colleagues said that uh, about a room being available. There is, in fact, a room available. I sought advice from our health colleagues. There is a room available, a private room, where people can be taken. Now, this is used by people with mental health issues. And so when um, prisoners in, or people in custody, police custody, turn up, the room is often occupied. So I think what this motion is asking is, can there be more capacity? I take the point of Councillor Kayam that we have a pandemic on, but COVID cannot overrule everything. 
we have also got to consider other factors and I think that Councillor Fox's motion should be supported. I think there's very good reason that we ought to provide uh, the opportunity for our police to be doing their job. I feel strongly about that too. So um, I will be supporting the motion. Thank you. Uh, um, is, I'd just yep. like to ask the legal officer, because I think there's, there's a problem with, in paragraph four, these words about if it would help if people in custody were, were seen urgently. And this is what the Labour group is, is latching onto, but that's not recommended in the motion. So um, is it in order for me to, to ask if Councillor Fox would be willing to, willing to take out that particular sentence? Because I think if that were taken out, it would mean that we could probably all support it. Yes, that's fine if Councillor Fox is willing to do that. So, Councillor Fox will be happy to remove what, what uh, two lines? Okay, I would suggest that, it, that we remove this, this sentence which says in paragraph 4, it would benefit all parties if people in custody were, were seen urgently so that officers can get back, back on, the, on the road. Because I think that is what is leading to the implication that, you know, that these people need to be seen, seen more urgently than people who may be a higher clinical So, Councillor Fox, so are you prepared to alter your motion? And do we have the consent of the room to the alteration? I'm more than happy with that. Uh, probably the wrong use of the word, but more than happy with that taken out. OK. Thank you. So we're going to move now. Councillor Bisbee, you seconded the motion. Would you like to take your... Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, I understand the medical uh, people turning around and saying that they are full and they are uh, actually busy with other patients. And this is not asking for these uh, people in custody to be prioritised. What it's asking is for them to be put in the place so that... Uh, as a case that I actually went to and saw some of the people who were ill traumatised by the behaviour of somebody in custody fighting against uh, the police officers. So it was traumatising uh, for those people and for the staff as well. So what we're asking, and I agree with uh, what Councillor Walsh said, it's about capacity and looking for more capacity to be able to take people in custody uh, who may or may not be guilty of an offence and give them the privacy uh, and also protect the other patients from any traumatic incidents that they may have. It's, this is not, as somebody else said, about going over somebody who's having a heart attack. That is not what we, we're looking at. It would be fantastic to see officers back out on patrol as soon as possible. We know that there is, there is a lot of uh, capacity for uh, COVID and other things, and so Councillor Coyam has a point of order. Point of information, please. Um, I'll keep it factual. The fact of the matter. Uh, sorry, Councillor Coyam, there is no oh. point of information. Should Why am I not allowed to order? make a point? Okay, so it will be a point of order. It's still not workable because it doesn't come under the remit of public health to suggest to NWAT so to give more Councilor capacity, Ka I'm afraid, Ka Mr. Mayor. I think you're looking for an explanation. Our statement of accuracy, beg your pardon, Rule 2015. Can you state that again? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm st um, what I wanted to say in terms of um, point of information is that even if we do take that paragraph out, which um, has been suggested, it's still not a workable motion because this doesn't come under the remit of public health to suggest to NWAFT to grant Sorry, more capacity. Right. Councillor you. Kayam, you've made a point, uh, and that will be decided on the vote. Councillor Bisbee, was it? Yes, thank you. So. I agree that uh, some of the people that are in custody are very violent at times and the last thing we want is for other people to be traumatised by this. So I agree with Councillor Fox in trying to see if there can be increased capacity of a room to take these people out of the public eye and it is for privacy as well. Councillor Fox, can you sum up please? 
Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate everything our NHS colleagues do, and they do a fantastic and wonderful job. And um, long about that rain, I'm not asking f for. <laughs> there was a way it's changed, I know, but there was a way that you could get. I don't know how to put it. Um, they, they did get seen quite quicker than they do now, and I know that's because Peterborough has grown two or three times in size. And that could be one of the reason and staff shortages. But I don't see a problem with, on a Thursday, Friday and Saturday night especially, that there should be a room, if not just one, two or three, where they can be taken because for the reasons already given. So I, I do hope you support my motion. Right, thank you. We're moving to the vote. Um, I think there's going to be some dissent, so move to Rachel. Thank you, Mr Mayor. So, councillors, we're now voting on the motion from Councillor John Fox in relation to A&E patients in custody as amended at tonight's meeting, so removing that sentence out. All those in favour, please raise your green cards. All, all those against, red cards, please. No abstentions, thank you. Okay. Thank you. The result is 38 in favour. 20 against, there were no abstentions, therefore this is agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, motion number three um, from Councillor Murphy in relation to fireworks. Councillor Murphy, would you like to move your motion? Yes, Mr Mayor, I'd like to move this motion. Um, we have had motions on fireworks and antisocial use within this council before. It seems to be an ongoing problem. In August this year in Peterborough, there seemed to be a regular use of noisy fireworks and it increased into September and continued for a while. It, it abated um, in November. Um, my concern is that the public make representations on this issue and they don't really know who's responsible. That's because it's not clear. The council has regulatory powers and the police service have legal powers as well. And indeed, uh, not so long ago in Neverton, um, the police service attended late at night to people that were using fireworks illegally because it was after 11 p.m. I've written to the Police and Crime Commissioner's Office on behalf of residents and corresponded with them and continued to correspond with them. And so I'm assured the police have taken some action. It's particularly the noise that's a nuisance and is antisocial. And only this week there was a petition to Parliament about the noise. And there is, in the new year, a private member's bill coming in that might address this. So let's watch out for it. But I would like Council to note the motion, hear from other Council members, and I would like some action to be done so that the noisy fireworks, they don't actually provide a lot to private displays, the noise. You know, it, it's, it's the lights, it's the designs, it's the colours. Um, if we could do something on, on the noise, I think that would be a significant improvement to the current situation and will be of particular help to improving animal welfare and other issues as well. Um, but I would like to thank the police service for responding recently and dealing with some people who were going around in cars and setting off fireworks late at night outside people's houses. I thank you for your contributions to follow and look forward to the debate. Thank you, Councillor Harper. Will you second the motion? Either speak now or reserve your right. Yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, so I uh, second the motion. A uh, pleasure in doing that. I'll speak now, if I may. Uh, please. Um, I think 
uh, you know, I wouldn't be teaching you to suck eggs to say that as councillors we must listen to the general public out there. And I think this, this issue is getting worse and worse. Now, let me be clear, I would never support a ban, a total ban on fireworks, and I don't support um, large displays only as well. I think used responsibly at home, in your garden, in the, you know, at the right time, with the right noise levels. We've all done that. We all have great fun, you know, and have a hot dog and some fireworks. Great. Uh, and I, I would never go against that. But as Councillor Murphy said, the noise is the problem. We've got fireworks that are... It seems to be a challenge to firework manufacturers to see how loud you can get that thunderclap to happen. Now, Councillor Murphy mentioned uh, or alluded to the well-known fact that, that this affects animals. Now, we know that. I think the RSPCA are always on it every year, and we know that. But what tends to be forgotten is the, amount, the effect this can have on people such as the heroes that have served on the war front for us. Um, you know, PTSD, people with PTSD, people with... Um, Nervous dispositions, maybe, is that you know, who, who basically are badly affected by bangs, and there is a way around it. Sainsbury's did the right thing; they completely stopped fireworks. What I would like to see done, and why I'm asking for your support on this, is that we drive towards low noise or no noise, and also, obviously, tighten up on when you can do it. So. I know there's lots of different festivals where these are enjoyed, and I would never stop that. I think it's a great thing. Birthdays, New Year, different festivals, fantastic. Support it totally. But we need to do something about driving down the noise, and I ask for your support on this motion. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Right. Um, does it look like we're agreeing on this? Uh, Councillor Murphy, would you like to just quickly sum up? No, thank you very much for your agreement and let's hope the police service and our regulatory authorities can work together and let's keep an eye on the bills going through Parliament. Thank you. So one final call. Is this all agreed? Thank you, Rachel. Um, now, motion number four in relation to the County Pension Fund. Um, Councillor Murphy, I understand that you no longer wish to move this motion, is that correct? Um, Mayor, I'd like to inform Council that I do not wish to move this motion this evening. That's accepted. Thank you. Uh, so, number five, uh, from Councillor Samford, this motion is in relation to moving to net zero carbon and the local electricity bill. Councillor Samford, would you please move yes, your motion? Yes, thank you. You've, you've rather taken me by surprise by agreeing the other ones. So quickly, so I've now got to find my notes on the um, motion. Just pause a minute. Um, yeah, um, I do think it's important that we do that. I do actually introduce this m m motion and say what it's concerning, because um, the l local electricity bill is a private member's bill which has been introduced into Parliament, um, which is basically trying to sort out a problem that we currently have, and I've got the problem, I can't find my notes. Uh, that's my colleague would find that. <laughs> uh, but it's, um, it's actually, thank you. Turn it upside down. Right, okay. it's, it's, so, yeah, um, I just like to explain what the bill is concerning. It's about enabling local producers of renewables, whether they be private individuals, community groups, or even small companies, to sell their green energy through the grid to local people at affordable prices without having to go through one of the large energy suppliers. Currently this is technically possible, but the costs and regulatory processes involved make it prohibitive. When the gas and electricity industries were privatised back in the 1980s, the majority of power at that time was generated by large coal and gas fire power st stations. So privatisation was achieved by setting up two large energy companies and, and a series of energy supply companies. As they were really large companies, um, that there was an awful lot of registration and complexity to enable those companies to trade in the, in the, the energy market at that time. So that business model was appropriate for the 1980s, but it is neither proportionate nor appropriate now in 2021. Central government and the council has ambitious targets to get to net zero carbon and we need to invest more in low carbon methods of energy production which are often small scale. 
So um, it's, it's important that you know, we encourage people to, to have solar panels on their house, but also that we have community renewable energy schemes. So what the Local Energy Bill is aiming to do is to make the costs and, re and re regulation of small-scale energy producers more proportionate and, and affordable. The bill will favour small-scale renew renew renewables, but an important point is it is agnostic as to the precise source of where the energy actually comes from. It's not about whether it's appropriate to build a, a wind turbine in a particular location. It's about reducing the cost of re regulation. It's not about planning. The bill is a private member's bill introduced in 2019. Our own MP Paul Bristow supports it. Um, it, it was introduced again in July 2021 and is going to have its second reading in December in the House of Commons. It now has the support of 280 MPs and just under 100 councils of passed motions in support of it. Like most private members' bills, it will only become law if the government gives it their support. So what this campaign is about is putting pressure on the government to back the bill and help it in, in, on, on on its, on its way. We need to get our city to net zero carbon by 2030. To do that, we need more renewables and a market which enables it to be sold at affordable prices to local people. So this bill and this motion is about being green. It's about tackling fuel poverty. It's about creating a freer and more localised energy market. So I hope you will give the bill and this motion your full and enthusiastic support. Thank you. Councillor Simons, you. you're second in the motion. Are you speaking now or reserving your right? Yeah, I'm happy to second uh, and I reserve my right. Right. Now, do we have any other speakers? Agreed. Okay. Agreed. Are you happy, Councillor Joseph? Everybody agreed then? Thank you. All right. Um, motion number six from Councillor Day. This motion is in relation to the production of a climate change adaptation action plan. Council Day, please, would you move your motion? Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd like to move my motion. OK. This motion seeks to protect Peterborough and our communities from extreme weather events, in this instance, flooding and heat waves. This motion differs from the climate emergency motion that was passed in 2019. The climate emergency motion was about how to reach net zero carbon by 2030. This motion looks to mitigate the effects of carbon emissions that are already baked into our atmosphere. We have increasingly experienced extreme weather events in Peterborough and the UK, which will only worsen. Borges Boulevard has flooded three times since the beginning of 2020, in February 2020, December 2020, and in July 2021. The most severe being this summer in July 2021, causing vehicles and ambulances to come to a standstill. Flooding caused significant tailbacks on Fletton Parkway heading into I. Cars were left abandoned on the roadside, and the recently opened Audi store was flooded the Queensgate bus station had to be closed due to water levels and the car haven was also flooded. We also have many residents that live close to floodplains and we need to, this motion calls for action to protect those residents. In 2007, the BBC aired a programme with Sir David Attenborough which featured a predicted weather forecast using Met Office modelling for summer 2020. It predicted top temperatures of 30 degrees in London and 28 degrees in northern England. In reality, the southeast hit 33 degrees last July and temperatures climbed into the high 20, south, 20 degrees as far as north of Scotland. 95% of heat-related deaths in London and the West Midlands occurred in hot weather below the heat wave action threshold of 32 Celsius. This motion is all about understanding planning and taking the necessary action to protect residents and our local communities. COP26 is already going to fail us with measures in place that will only limit global warming to 2.4 degrees. So we as a local authority must begin to take action. Without action today, adaptation will be costlier for future generations. I hope this motion will be supported by all members today and I thank Councillor Simons for seconding the motion. Councillor Simons, over to you. Happy to second and I um, support everything that Councillor Day has said. Thank you. And is that you speaking now? Are you resuming? That's speaking right? me, yeah, speaking now, thank you. Thank you. Um, Amjad Iqbal wants to speak. Councillor Amjad Iqbal. Green. 
Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would like to speak on the motion, even though I know everybody's going to agree on it. Um, as of the councils across the UK begin climate adaptation action plans, I feel that no city can afford to drag its feet far too long on this. We need to set our vision, our priorities, and plea, uh, plan, plan key actions for a resilient council and a resilient city. If we get this right, we will be more successful in continuing good service delivery and the protection of assets in the face of the climate change effects, as well as minimizing impacts on the daily lives on the people of Peterborough. Council Day's motion is about the future proving of our city, and that is surely always a sensible move. Council Day's motion is also asking for the go-ahead to produce a costed proposal for the development of an adaptation plan which cover a range of weather events and increasing temperatures. The only concern that I have about the motion is the practicality and indeed the deliverability of the actions called for given the call on officers' time and resources. Thank you. Uh, can I just remind, um, it looked like everybody was agreeing. Uh, so with that, does Councillor Robinson want to speak now? Uh, well, I did have a, a question as well as supporting it. I wanted to ask that as part of the adaptation plan that the Cabinet considers in particular sustainable drainage systems. Um, there's loads of great ideas out there and we don't have any of them, so I'd just like to ask that that could be part of the adaptation plan. For example, this expensive new car park, um, you know, can it please be a permeable design or will it turn into a lovely new pond on the embankment? Um, but I'm really pleased that the motion's been agreed. I think we, we can ask the uh, mover to consider that when he passes on these details. Um, so, are we agreed, everybody? Well, let's move on then, thank you. Uh, motion 7, Councillor Hogg, in relation to protected trees related in planning applications. Councillor Hogg, please would you move your motion? Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, and I will try and be as brief as possible because I'm sure. We, we all want to be in a better place, um, i.e. our homes. Um, I, I think there's been maybe a, a miscommunication somewhere because this isn't specifically about trees. Um, the trees are included in it, but it, it's not specifically about trees by, by any, any stretch of the imagination. Um, what this um, motion seeks to do is uh, it's, it's merely asking um, the Planning and Environmental Protection Committee to consider um, the fact that Currently, we have a situation where um, councillors, uh, head of service, uh, director level uh, for the authority, uh, or their spouses and partners um, need to um, have their applications, or planning applications, be it about you know increasing the size of their property or the fact that they want to do something with a with, with a tree, a protected tree. Um, that it needs to go to committee, and, and the reason for that, uh, and rightly so, um, is to provide greater transparency so that members of the public don't feel that things are happening behind scenes, etc., etc. Uh, and, and I think that, that everybody understands why that is in place. Uh, the reason for this is to basically say, well, actually the council has a number of applications that g go through um, on, a, on a regular basis. Um, and, um, you know, maybe the council uh, applications need to be afforded that same level of extra transparency so that members of the public can see what the council is doing, why they're doing it, and have the opportunity to, to um, you know, put an input into that. So uh, I'm not asking for, for the change to actually happen tonight. What I'm saying is it needs to go to the, the Planning and uh, Environmental Protection Committee to consider this. Um, it may be that due to the level of, of, of applications, it, it might be unworkable, and, and so be it. That, that, that at least it's, it's been looked at, is the point that I'm trying to make. Or there may be some sort of hybrid um, solution whereby uh, maybe group reps are, are able to, um, mm. uh, to you know, sort of decide whether or not certain applications go forward, but others don't. Um, and with that, um, I will uh, open it up to. Uh, to some debate. I, I can see that uh, Councillor Hiller is um, champing at the bit. Um, Councillor Samford, I believe you're seconding the motion. Yes, I'll second it and I'll reserve my right to speak. Thank you. Thank you. I'll call on Councillor Hiller. 
Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Hogg, I don't think you've ever seen me champ at the bit. As, as you put it, it would, uh, it would take more than one of your motions to, for that to happen. Um, Mr. Mayor, I, I, I can't support this motion, I'm afraid. I, I, whatever the political motivation behind it is, uh, the, the main issue I have with the motion is, is that it hasn't really been researched properly and may very well be self-defeating um, in, in that applications which include works to conservation area trees have to be determined within a fixed time scale. That, that's a fact. Um, if, if they're not, determined by a delegated officer within a fixed time scale, then they get automatic permi permission, um, which I think would be self-defeating, given the essence of, of what Councillor Hogg has said. Um, so therefore, Mr. Mayor, the, these applications don't suit being pushed through to the planning committee, which, which in my many years' experience on that committee, obviously uh, and, and frequently takes, uh, takes additional time for applications to come before the members. Um, Members here tonight should also re be reminded that they can all call in tree works applications to the committee anyway. Um, you can all do that if there are valid um, planning uh, relevances with, with regard to any application. So, so <laughs> my question to, to Councillor Hogg is what's the point of the additional risk on determination uh, with this suggested blanket approach? Um, as I say, whatever the political motivation behind the, the motion, I, I can't support it. I think it's been ill thought out, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Harper? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, uh, my colleague's taken all my um, speech away. <laughs> so, but I would just like to, to point out as well, when we're talking about transparency, you probably know that the, uh, with me being the chair, that there are certain decisions that I am asked to make for things that the council are responsible for, such as school properties, fencing, extra mobile classrooms. But you'll also know that if you're the ward council in that ward, you will be contacted with my decision and you can, again, call it in. So the democracy side of it is all there. And as council has said, if it's a tree, you can call it in. If it's something to do with anything that the council own that I have make a decision on, you can call that in and bring it to the committee. So again, I, I agree really. Um, I don't know where you're going. I don't know where it comes. You know whether it's needed. I don't don't see any need for it. We're already fully transparent, and you've all got the opportunity to call it in. So if there's a problem, call it in. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, call me an old romantic, if you will. As much as I would like to see greater transparency, um, what Councillor Hiller and Councillor Harper have said already is uh, yes. I would like to see some of this go through, but it just isn't workable. It isn't practical or practicable, and um, it's not something that I feel that I can support on this occasion. Thank you, Councillor Amjadik Bell, and then we'll go to the vote. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I also agree with um, Councillor Hiller and other, other colleagues. Um, I think he gave an, uh, he's given a, a very comprehensive uh, response and He's raised issues uh, which um, can be an issue for the uh, planning committee, and therefore um, I also cannot support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Sanford, you were uh, reserving your right. Yeah, I do. Want, I do want to talk on this. Actually, um, you know, I, I think this is a motion that's about openness and transpa transparency. Councillor Hogg is absolutely right to say it's not only about trees, it's about any case in which the council is pla effectively planning, applying to itself for, 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 for planning consent. Now, the, 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 how, it, how it comes to, to be relevant to trees is we're going to have a debate on a petition at the December council meeting, I understand, about the Bretton Oak tree. Now, you know,